Hey, welcome everybody. My name is Daryl Akins and I am hosting season three of the Umqua Signature Tyra series and we're gonna talk warm water tonight. So settle in, get a beverage and type away some questions in chat and we're gonna talk a lot of warm water flies. Carp, bass, dorado, peacock bass, striper, what? Warm water, fun fish. So let's get some stuff out of the way right now. We're gonna have a bunch of people to thank. We have a bunch of people visiting and doing videos for us tonight. We're gonna go ahead and remember to like, subscribe. There's a little notification button somewhere up here, press it. And what happens is that little bell will ring every time Umpa uploads something. What are they uploading? All of these videos. So you actually get to go onto Umpa's page on YouTube and see all of these videos in their entirety, even after we're done. Pretty cool stuff. And a lot of different flies to tie as well. Uh, let's thank Trout Unlimited, right? This whole series has been pretty cool and they've been along for the ride for us. Make sure that we're all members and taking care of our local communities here. Uh, we want to go to uh, the last one here is, oh, that Instagram bad, YouTube good. So check it out. If you're watching on Instagram, you're going to have a very cropped picture because things are going to be in the vertical bat rather than the horizontal. So for instance, if I were to grab a large fly, like this and show you, you're probably not gonna see the whole fly. But if you're on YouTube, you've got the whole fly. So come on over to YouTube. Better picture, better crowd, better chat. Okay, now let's talk some warm water flies. Who's got something to talk about? Carp maybe? Okay. So we're going to talk carp flies tonight. I believe the first two videos we're going to roll are specifically designed for carp. Uh, so we can talk some carp for a while. Uh, you want to talk flies. We can talk rigging. We can talk a few things. I'm pretty open to it all, and I want to make sure that at the end of the day, I uh, put everything I have into it. So let's talk some carp flies. Sorry, I have a lot of digital things happening here. There we go. All right, so tonight I am going to be tying my hipster doofus, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, uh, but most uh, people know of the doofus before other flies, and uh, we're, I'm going to dive into some of my other flies uh, and discuss how I, I fish those as well, because a lot of those flies are going to be dictated uh, on how I think about uh, fishing for those mid to upper column fish which is a great, great segue for our first fly, which is going to be Lance's headstand, uh, Egan's headstand. It is one of those soft landers and, and, and slow sinkers, and that is in my wheelhouse. If you know of my flies, most of them are going to give you that added advantage of hitting the water softly, sinking slowly, and if you use a floating line, you'll get an arc on that presentation and that bug falls because your line's going to hold up and that bug's not going to fall straight down. So that, that, that arc, when it falls down, is going to give you a presentation that's a little more natural because that is fluttering down. Uh, I'm not going to get too techy uh, or too nerdy. However, when I speak of resistance, there's two things happening, right? Resistance is, is what happens when the fly falls down and has all kinds of materials to get in the way of it falling. The reaction to the resistance is actually called upward force. The upward force is actually slowing the fly down. So by tying in materials to provide some resistance and giving us some upward force, we can control the sink rate of that fly and take advantage of the mid and upper columns. So don't get me wrong. I love tailing fish. We all love to see happy fish. But I really, really enjoy seeing cruisers dive and follow my fly. And the... You're making that fish make a decision, right? Fish that are already tailing, they're really giving us all the signs that they're happy. Our only responsibility is a good is a, is a good presentation. That cruiser doesn't know exactly what he wants to eat yet. That's why he's, you know, he's cruising around and he'll go down. So to get a fish that isn't 100% sure what it wants to eat to follow and then eat your fly is, is, is a pretty awesome thing to watch. And again, there's they're swimming down. So you're going to have about a two second window, 1001, 1002. And then I'm looking for my floating line to twitch for the eat. 
If I get to that three and three and a half game over, he passed up. You'll see him kind of come back up probably and continue tic tacking along the shore. But love the cruisers. And a lot of my flies are going to land soft and sink slow, specifically for those two columns. And the headstand is perfect for that. I know that the headstand's really strong on tailing fish. Uh, whether you're casting it or dabbing it, you do a little quick roll cast or a flick. It's a very, very versatile fly. But I've got to the point where with cruisers, I don't look for a specific fly. I look for a specific type of fly. So anything that's going to land softly and sink slowly a little farther than normal to cause a, a, a curiosity with that fish. I, I, I found that the closer that, that fly is and the fish can actually see it, my odds kind of go down. Carp kind of see well up close, right? And they don't see well far away. If you, if you imagine what they see far away as like a watercolor painting where they can probably see shapes well, but the colors, there's no definition. It's just kind of colors that kind of move around, right? So that's why being camouflaged and moving slowly absolutely benefits in carp because again, I, if you envision them seeing in watercolor, it gives you a perspective of how we can kind of move without being detected. And I think that's the same thing when they see flies. They're prolific eaters, that's all they do. We don't want to give them too much credit. So if there's a fly just out of the, where they can't see it, out of their scope of sight, that curiosity uh, on a fish in warm months, you're going to get them to check it out. And that's really the advantage uh, to that slow sinking fly. Toss it out, cause curiosity, maybe a couple of feet out or in and get that fish to dive and chase. And it's usually about a, a one or a two count to wait to get that, uh, that line to twitch. And then it's just a quick, small salt set to the side. I'm, I'm a big to the side fan. I'll only do a trout set when I when I when it calls for, uh, when it's called for. All those set set uh, trout set hook set whatever fit are in my bag. Ninety five percent of the time, it's usually just to the side with a quick strip, and we're good. Uh, sometimes you have rocks and stuff around there, and you, you're just going to have to come up. That's just how it is. But yeah, the slow sinkers. The soft landers are just in my wheelhouse, which is why the headstand was always, always, always uh, in my box. Anybody got any questions here? Let's see what do we have here. Love the. We're still going. All right, we're still going. Sorry. Hey, we're good. That's okay. Hit a button. I hit a button. I hit buttons all the time. Uh, let's see. Let's read you. Love the video you did. The doofus you're assigned. Just appreciate you. Appreciate you. Um, go full nerd. <laughs> hey, Mike, I want to thank you, man. You've been like with us every week and we really appreciate you. It hasn't gone unnoticed. Thanks for following along. Uh, there are a couple other videos out there uh, that I have. Uh, there's one uh, at Angler's All. That's the shop I work at. Great family. Great people. Stop by and see me. I will talk your ear off on time. Uh, immaterials. Uh, I did a video with Anglers All, the HVRT carp fly, uh, which is also picked up by Umqua. You'll see that down the road. Just put a pin in that one, but that one's coming. Uh, and I have a video with uh, with Trouts, uh, the Detroit Mop City, which <laughs> I'm somewhat both proud and ashamed. It's an hour long, so it's actually over an hour. But uh, if you know me, I'm not short-winded. I'm not concise. I'm going to pretty much just keep going until someone tells me to, to stop. But it's not babbling. I'm, I promise I'm helping out with, with tying that fly. There's a lot of little tips in there that'll help you out. That's for sure. Uh, let's see here. What else? I have? Oh, yeah. So aside from those three flies uh, in my arsenal to kind of follow up on the soft landers, the wakame salad is my, my go-to fly on any cruising carp because of the soft landing in the slow sinking that it has. It is my softest and slowest of the bunch. And right behind that would be the HVRT carp fly. Um, and if you're not familiar with the HVRT carp fly, but you've heard of the Havarti carp fly, they're the same fly, but it's been called the Havarti fly and unknowingly. So it's all good. I don't care what you call it, but HVRT carp fly is uh, the name. But it's again, it's very much like the headstand. Uh, it's going to be a soft lander, a slow sinker, 
Uh, I employ the same thing Lance does with the tail drag, uh, with the tail material. Uh, you're essentially creating a double down eye to help turn that hook over. Um, and, and I'll cover that later in the show, but you'll see Lance do that with, with the rabbit on this, how he, he brings it down. And again, that double double down eye is what you're creating to help that fly turn over is, is just, it's money. So yes, the HRT lands in that same zone of a, a low impact, slow sinker uh, on tailing carp that you can kind of cast out and have something with not a lot of energy that'll land soft for you. Um, but yeah, those two are my slow sinkers. I've caught grassies. Uh, on my uh, on the wakame tied both in olive and black uh, the, the wakame salad is now tied on 2457 it was tied on the umqua what is it the c47 or c c430 which was the competition jig hook in a size 10 it is a beautiful hook two things one it was a thin a thinner wire because it was a jig hook it wasn't one of the brawnier jig hooks so it didn't last through many fish. Uh, I've, I've caught some pretty nice grassies on that, but it, it, it'll it'll bend out on a fish that big if you're landing it yourself. Um, so I had to I had to change the hook because I just felt bad selling it on a hook that may bend out on a big fish. So I changed that out. Uh, I do tie it for myself, and you can certainly tie it yourself uh, on one of those tactical jig hooks and, and get a, a lighter, even slower sinking fly. Uh, it, you, you can't go wrong. But yeah, the Wakame. Uh, we'll cover uh, with dubbing loops uh, here down the road for sure. We have any fun questions? Who wants to talk carp flies? Coming in. All right. Let's see video. Okay. Let's see here. All right. Let's watch a video here. New, new to carp water conditions, but okay. You know what? There's a lot to unpack there. All right. I'm gonna get to those. Let's get carpy. Let's kind of get in the mood. Let's get the, the juices flowing. Uh, this is Lance's pattern. Uh, this pattern is actually a trailblazer of patterns. Uh, one of the first to ride hook up. Uh, one of the first to allow you to have a lighter fly that you can cast or drop in a tailing carp. Uh, this pattern was picked up back in 2006 by Umqua. One of the first carp flies to be picked up. Uh, so he's in some really cool company as far as having a fly for carp pretty early in the game distributed through Umqua. Just awesome stuff. I'm sure it didn't hurt that he had the Rainbow Warrior and a few others going his way, but hey, it's a pretty carpy fly. That's for sure. I've got my very first mirror on a, on a headstand. I still have that very fly in my car. Won't get rid of it. Tattered to bits. Still fishes. Uh, you can't go wrong with the Egan's headstand. You just, just can't. So check this video out. You can learn some really cool tips on how to tie a light, soft landing, and well-eaten carp fly. Hello fellow carp slayers. This is Lance of Fly Fish Food. I want to show you my most popular uh, in fish catching carp fly. This one's called the headstand. The headstand uh, was early on one of the first carp flies that was commercially available. It's, it's a uh, cool little pattern that I devised long ago when I was really really into carp. I still like to chase carp uh, Several times a year, though I don't do it as much as I once did, I tend to go through phases like probably all of us in our fly fishing life, but uh, it's still be, it's still one of my favorite patterns, still one that I tie on all the time. I joke that this is kind of the royal wolf of uh, carp flies. It imitates nothing. We don't know why they eat it. Uh, carp are pretty opportunistic. They're omnivorous. So maybe uh, if you just present it right and you get it to look like food, act like food, they think it's food. Fly fish food. That's what we like. Anyhow. Let's get this one started. So we've got a Tiemco size 8, 2457, 2457 size 8. So it's a scud hook and a size 8. Okay. I'm going to run uh, chartreuse thread, UTC 140, upside down, fluorescent chartreuse. That's a little better. I'm going to start that just behind the eye and get rid of the tag end. Okay, next up I'm going to tie in the eyes. The eyes are bead chain eyes. In, uh, on this size I like them in size medium. If you needed to make them heavier you could do size large. Uh, you need them to be at least size medium though so they'll help turn the hook over. So I'm going to latch them in on top of the hook and figure eight them into place. 
One thing you can do here also, which I'll do right now, I like to put just a touch of super glue on these eyes. That'll keep them from uh, coming undone. It doesn't take much, just a little bit of super glue right between the eyes. Then you can keep figure eighting. Wrap around the shank, the base of them as well to tighten up those wraps. Okay, we should have them tied in. So there, the idea here is this is going to ride inverted again. And the other idea at play here is that carp have a mouth that's kind of offset. So their upper lip is uh, it extends farther out than their lower lip. The reason for that is when they tilt up to eat a fly, okay, they come in and they eat a fly something like this. My thumb being their uh, their lower lip and their my fingers being their upper lip. Because of their angle, if you have a hook that rides down like that, a lot of times when you set the hook, you don't actually penetrate. So with the hook point up like that you'll end up grabbing them. I did that the backwards way. Usually they're eating it this way like this, but you're going to grab them in the upper lip with that hook as it rides up. The other advantage here is that uh, we're going to fish near the bottom oftentimes for carp, and so having that hook inverted will keep it from snagging as often. We're going to build a couple more features into this fly to really make it stand on its head, thus the name the head stand, but that's kind of the uh, theory behind this type of a, of a fly. So I figured aided, figure aided my uh, my eyes on there, I'm going to wrap the thread back down the shank and I'm going to actually change the angle of the hook and the vise so that I can tie a tail on that extends quite a ways down. The idea from this came from bonefish flies, basically with crazy charlies and things back in the day when they were uh, very, very popular, still are for bonefish flies. I thought, why not uh, use the same type of an idea for a carp fly? Carp feed very similarly to bonefish other than they're a lot less uh, aggressive than bones. You have to get a fly much closer to them. They're pretty spooky, however, and they like stuff right near the bottom. So we're gonna we're gonna appeal to their uh, feeding habits, their feeding preferences. So I'm gonna take the tail material next and tie it in. It's uh, just chartreuse green and chartreuse rabbit strips. Okay, I'm just gonna get a little bit of it. If you had a full uh, pelt of uh, chartreuse rabbit, that would be good too. My kids often ask me if rabbits are really this color. I always laugh at that joke. It's not really a funny joke, but I think it's funny when my four-year-old asked me if there's really chartreuse rabbits running around. Anyway, side note there. I'm going to cut off a little bit of the uh, rabbit fur from the skin, so I'm not going to use the skin. I'm going to take some of the really long guard hairs and get rid of those. And I'm just going to tie it in by the butts. Okay, that one's a little bit longer than I like, so I'm going to back it up just a little bit and make it just a touch shorter. I'm going to wrap over that rabbit hold it in place you'll see the rabbit kind of compresses pretty well makes a pretty nice little tie in right okay so now we've got our tail in place there you can kind of see it a little bit better tail is going to give us a little bit of motion and uh, the rabbit's nice because it'll twitch and, and animate even when it's just resting Next up we're going to make the body. The body is just crystal chenille, uh, pearl chenille and fluorescent chartreuse. This is one, as you can see, this is a really bright fly. Uh, I've heard people tell me that carp don't like bright flies, but they sure like this one, so I think you ought to give it a whirl. There are certainly some places where bright flies don't work. Maybe on a lake where they're really dialed into crayfish or something like that, this wouldn't be my go-to color. But when I'm just searching for carp on a lake that I've never been to, that I don't know anything about, this is usually the first fly I tie on. I can see it. It's very easy to see since I'm usually sight fishing for carp. This makes it very easy to tell whether or not they've got my fly in their mouth, right? Okay, so I tied in the chenille and then I rotated my, my thread right up the shank to behind the eyes. I'm going to make sure I don't capture any of that tail with the chenille and then we're going to use the rotary function of the master vise and rotate the chenille up the shank. That to hang over the eyes a bit more. There we go. I'm going to get that one more wrap probably. There we go. One more wrap to, to where we're right at the eyes. See that okay? And I'm going to tie it off, get rid of the chenille. So we've got a nice flashy body. Now I'm going to reposition that hook in the vise again. So it's just set in there like it normally would be. Okay, the next step we're going to add some legs to this. So the legs are grizzly legs in chartreuse. You can see a pattern emerging here, chartreuse everything, right? 
these are awesome. They've got a lot of color variation, a lot of barring to them. The dark chartreuse, or sorry, the dark black and then barring, and then the bright chartreuse. Really good contrasting color. Great for murky water conditions or when carp are really mudding hard. You can see this fly. They can still see this fly. So I'm going to take a little bit of that flutter leg and I'm going to tie it in on my side. Notice I've got the hook inverted. That's one of the beautiful things about a rotary vise. I'm going to tie it in on my side first. Then I'm going to wrap the leg around in front of the eye like that and capture it on the far side. So it looks something like that. Okay, once I've got it tied in, I can trim this kind of close to length. It doesn't have to be exact yet. Yet I can always come back later and make it a little more exact. But those kind of work like little uh, stabilizing bars, outriggers, if you will. They're going to keep that from rolling on either side. When it sinks to the bottom, they'll just make it lay uh, head, head down and, and the tail waving in the air. So I've got those legs tied in nicely. The next step is to use a bit of... Uh, Peacock sword. This is a really cool material that you don't see used a lot in today's patterns. It's got a lot of color to it. It's uh, a little different than the hurl. It's you can see a lot of iridescence to it, just like peacock hurl, but it's short fibered. It has a little more curve to it. I'm going to grab maybe I don't know five or six, maybe seven of these strands of the fibers here of the uh, peacock sword, and I'm just going to tie it in as kind of a almost like a hook guard if you will. If you can think of a, a bass jig or anything like that it might have a monofilament hook guard, that's more or less what this is going to do. It's going to hide the hook a bit. It's also going to keep it from hanging up on the bottom as much and it adds a little darker back to our fly. So I've now got the peacock sword tied in. I tied them just on top of the eyes. I'm going to crisscross them a bit with the thread to make sure they're really latched in there. Then I can just get rid of the butt ends of the peacock sword. See how that is right on top of the hook shank? Actually, it's right on the bottom of the hook shank, but it's on top when I have the hook inverted. Okay, now we've got the sword in place. The last step is to just cover our eyes with some dubbing. So I've got ice dub and chartreuse. If you don't have ice dub in just about every color they make it, get online, store.flyfishfood.com, and order every color that appeals to you. Ice dub has quickly become one of my favorite dubbings. It came out years ago and I just keep buying more and more colors of it and I go through a lot of the colors of it. So this is chartreuse. I'm going to get a little bit of it, uh, pull a little bit of it out at a time and like all dubbing I want to add little bits to the thread. Don't try and add too much of this. You want to make a really thin dubbing noodle and make it long so you can wrap figure eight around these eyes several times. So it doesn't take very much dubbing on each pinch, just little bits to make kind of a long noodle. We'll run with that amount for now and see if we need more in a second. So I've got a pretty thin dubbing noodle here. And all I'm going to do is wrap around and just start covering the eyes. So sometimes figurating, sometimes just behind the eyes. Looks like we need a little bit more on this side. So I'm going to back up a couple wraps here. Go around that eye. Around this eye. Just like that. It doesn't have to be perfect, but we've got it to where it's Covering the eyes now, covering the thread and the tie-in, adds a little sparkle in case this one didn't have enough flash for the carp to find it before. That was a joke. Cheech doesn't know about this one. He thinks that all carp flies are really big and burly just because he's a little guy. He has like short man's complex or something. But Anyhow, I'm going to whip finish this little fly, get rid of the thread, and the last step would maybe come in here and trim up these legs, shorten them up just a touch even them out a little bit so we've got a nice profile to our bug so this little carp fly will really stand up on its head it'll sit kind of in the water like that at that angle with my fingers the bottom it sits up gives you a good profile allows the carp to get to it and it's flashy they can see it you can see it get it out on your favorite carp pond stick a big one That's a cool little guitar riff. Uh, I want to follow up on a few things just real quickly before we get to some questions. Um, I want you to, when you watch that video back, and you should go to Uncle's page on YouTube because they're all going to be there uploaded after this is over. Uh, you'll notice that Lance doesn't rush anything. And I can't stress this enough that when you're tying, the, the, the clock isn't running on you. So if you're wrapping something and it doesn't look right, back it off 
pull some dubbing off or re-rope it to make sure it's correct and then wrap it on. I mean, it's it's so easy to kind of bang through flies and not think of those small details. Those small details are really kind of what give you the consistency uh, and the flies that you want, basically. Your flies are really going to look good when you start taking a few extra seconds to check those. Uh, just great. And the second thing is, is, is when you look at a, a, a carp fly tied by Lance, you're going to know immediately that he ties a lot of trout flies because his proportions are just impeccable. When you look at the fly in, as a whole, nothing is standing out or saying, look at me more than the next. There's a very even visual profile to, to, to his fly and his tying in general. Uh, so very, very good practices, I think, in, in, in my opinion, is, is keeping some smaller fly in your arsenal that you want to tie. For me, when I tie smaller flies, and I've often talked about this in the shop, for me, acoustic guitar and electric guitar are small flies and bigger flies. So if I want to practice my proportions and make sure that everything is where it needs to be and my wraps are correct and I don't have anything too bulky, I will tie small flies because everything has to be right on, right? Same with acoustic guitar. If I play you three or four chords and I tank or throw a clam on a chord, you're going to know it's an acoustic guitar I can't hide. Conversely, if I plug in a, an electric guitar and I mess up a chord, chances are my effects, my distortion, maybe my wah pedal is going to help me cover that up. I have a little bit of play is my point. Same thing with bigger flies. I may not be able to take a gazillion extra wraps, but I have a few extra wraps with bigger flies. A little more room or margin to be frivolous, if you will. So to keep your perspective on your proportions, the bigger the fly goes, keep small flies in your repertoire because it's really going to keep you focused on the composition of a fly and how it's supposed to look silhouette tail to head without a doubt okay and you can see that lance's flies because he ties a lot of trout flies and it translates to his bigger flies and then at the end who can't tie a fly from fly fish food without taking a dig at cheech right okay let's answer some questions all right we've had a lot come in and that's cool because i have a lot to talk about okay so we're going to kind of talk about a couple of things here. The first one is kind of a trick question. It's going to be conditions. And you can't look for a specific condition or you're going to drive yourself bananas. It's the same thing on the trout side when people ask you, you fish in the middle of winter? It's like, as far as I know, fish still eat in the winter. You fish when it's raining out? Well, fish are still eating at some point, right? So fish eat all the time. They may not eat as much or as be as happy, but things are happening, right? So don't really look for a condition weather-wise. It's If you want to fish and you have the time, go find fish. That's that's just how it is, right? Pull up, walk a couple of banks. If you don't see fish, get back in and go to your next spot. Get used to hitting multiple spots because you're not going to always get what you want at the first pond or the first run on a river. It's a very hit and miss kind of thing, right? I mean, if I get out there, I, I can leave my house and it's sunny and I can drive 20 miles north and I have overcast skies. So I don't care what it looks like outside. Now, granted, if it's windy and storms rolling in, wind isn't a great thing. You're not going to really see a lot of ease. So you're going to suffer in the wind. Have I fished in wind? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm stubborn like that. That's what we call That's why we call it fishing, because we go with bad conditions. But, so don't don't get too condition specific. If you have the time and you want to go fish go fish. If you have overcast skies, there's there, there are ways you can get around that. You may not have the best visibility, but you have to be honest with yourself. There, there are so many things that are going to go wrong for you with carp on the fly that if you're not honest with yourself in, in the situations you're given, then you're going to really kind of take twice as long to kind of get to where you're going. So if, if the water is off, and the cloud cover is over and you don't have the best visibility, you need to spook a fish so you can see what the contrast is with the light, the water, and that fish. If you don't really see a fish, you're just it's really tough to know what you're looking for and you may miss it. Sometimes it's just going to be a swirl and you know there's a fish moving around. Sometimes you pull up to the pond, the water's clear, the sun's out, and you can see fish tailing forever, right? Those things don't happen all the time, so it's better to be like well versed in bad conditions. So that's why I say if, if you have time to fish, just go fish. 
don't worry about the you're going to have to adapt anyway. So my biggest like thing that I do as far as multi condition type fishing is the sunglasses, the lens that I use. I switch from amber to the uh, the chroma pop like rose, whatever I forget what the name of it is, igniter lens. That low light lens, and again, this is not for everybody, but for me, works in the sun and the dust, the dawn, the overcast light. I get more from that one lens than I got from a copper lens. This is really something that has to be, when you go into a fly shop, go outside in the sun and try those on because sometimes those low light in the full sun are too much if you have light sensitive eyes. I'm okay with it. It works for me, but that one pair of glasses allows me to see things when it's cloudy, before the sun comes up, and after the sun goes down, and obviously when the sun's up. It's not a total rose lens. There's some tint to it, but it's a low light lens, and it helps in bad conditions. So the low vis thing, I'll tag on one little thing with low vis. Low vis can be a very difficult, frustrating thing. You're really looking at um, what the water is giving you. So again, I'm I'm gonna I'm not trying to scare anyone away by trying to like micro manage and macro manage what you see when you go to the water, right? But just real quick, the water has levels of things happening in there that affect the clarity. So the biggest thing you need to do is get your eyes to adjust and find out the, the contrast from the fish to the bottom of the water to what's happening in between. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, spooking a fish will give you a lot of data. I know that's it's the last thing you want to do because that may be the only fish you see. But you may be searching for things that you don't know what you're looking for and you may be missing fish because you're not aware of what it looks like. So seeing a fish in bad conditions gives you a lot of information. What does that fish look like in contrast to what's happening with the water, the bottom, the mud, the glare? It's going to give you a lot of data in that sense. Two, how deep is the water, right? I mean, if it, you're going to see a swirl or a mud swirl. You can actually look at that as if it were a tail and go, all right, if that's the head, I should see a tail in a two, somewhere around a two-foot circle from that head. Now you need to kind of play detective and figure out what it is or where it is. You're going to have to guess a lot in bad conditions. It's just how it is. It's all good. Don't You, you can't beat yourself up for missing or failing. It's going to happen. Get used to it. I promise you, the more you fail, the more you're going to succeed because you're, you're, you're going to pay attention to those moments and you're going to learn something. So just kind of look at, and you see mud kind of pluming, but you don't see a fish. Look at the plume and draw a two foot circle around that, that, that plume where you see the action and look for something else, some nervous water, nervous water flies, to let you know where the tail may be. It's going to at least give you some information. If you cannot triangulate the tail, you're guessing. You're going to guess. I don't know what to tell you. You know, that I do it all the time. I get sometimes they don't give you the information and you're stubborn. I'm stubborn. I've just walked three miles of this spot. It's the first plume that I've seen and I've got no other information. I've been here for 10 minutes. This fish is going to swim away soon. So you guess that it's, it's okay to guess. Sometimes you guess and you win. A lot of times you guess and you lose. Here's the upside. If you lose and that fish bolts out, Pay attention because all of that data is there for you. What does the water look like? What does the fish look like? What's the glare look like when the water moves? All those things are relevant to your next eat, your next fish, your next plume. All right. So last thing on low vis, once your eyes adjust, the way our eyes work, right? Every time we look around, our eyes are firing in and adjusting to all kinds of light. Now, I'm not an eye guy. I've done a little bit of research, but trust me, I'm not... You can talk to someone else who's a pro. What I've gathered in my research is our eyes are always working and firing around, adjusting the light, color, depth, whatever we're looking at. When our eyes are fixated and adjusted on the water, the last thing you want to do, the last thing is to like break what you've just accomplished. Your eyes are like settled in to the depth of the water, what's working, what's not. It's all there. When you look up to see something, look at something, tie a fly on, your eyes are now readjusting and you have to go back to square one. So there's a way to minimize that. I know this is going to sound nuts and you're going to think that I'm kind of off my rocker, but there's a way to minimize that. And all you have to do is work with your eyes. When I move my eyes from the water 
to whatever. Maybe someone's behind me and they're talking to me. Maybe I'm going to change a fly. I have to open my eyes when I'm doing things. I don't have to open my eyes from point A to point B. That time when I'm looking from there to wherever I'm looking, my eyes are adjusting from all of that and then settling in here. I close my eyes and I reopen them where I want to look. Now my eyes have to adjust one time. Not all those times, one time. I see what I have to see, come back, I close them, and I look back at the water, and now my eyes have to readjust one time. I'm only giving them one task at a time when I do that. I'm not trying to give them everything in between. And, and so, one job. I'm going to close my eyes and reopen. I want you to look over here and tell me what I'm supposed to see, whatever it is. I'm going to close them and come back to the water and readjust my eyes. I know it sounds crazy, but when you get in situations where the water is off and you can't see a lot of fish and you know they're there, you have to work with what you have. And there are times where you can make your eyes work against you because you're looking everywhere and they're working all the time. So I could be, and that may not work, but hey, we all fish a particular fly or a color of fly because it makes us feel confident. So that's what I do. So that's my last top topic or tip on low vids. Now, real quick, lines leaders. This is an easy one. Leaders. If I am in a pond, lake, and I'm doing a lot of flipping, dapping, or just really, really short roll casts, I am a seven to a seven and a half foot leader. Nylon with the bottom two feet cut off, replace with fluorocarbon. Always, 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 always. Um, don't waste your money on a fluorocarbon leader. It's just not necessary for carp because you're only dealing with the bottom few feet anyway. A lot of my buddies, and I'm probably kind of moving that way, uh, we'll just tie a, a long stretch of straight mono uh, at a particular gauge, I don't know, maybe 15, 16 pound, and then taper down with tippet to your desired length. Uh, and there's a lot to be said about just one straight piece of mono on how it sinks versus a taper. Uh, and I can't argue with the physics in that. So really, it's just whatever works for you. The analogy that I use when you're fly fishing for carp, and really, this isn't just for carp. It can really be anything. But we're going to apply it to carp. Everybody that goes fly fishing for carp, I want you to think about we're all making a pizza, right? We're all going to make a pizza. It's going to have dough. It's going to have a sauce and maybe some sort of cheese. Even if it's gluten-free, dairy-free cheese, what? it's still cheese, okay? The toppings that each of us use is what we do to individualize how we chase carp. But at the end of the day, we're all making pizza. There's a few basic core kind of rules that we'll all follow, and then we're going to be an individual around those and find out what works for us as a, an individual and for us for our local fish and fisheries. So for me, and this happens to work for me because it's how I've, like tested my fly. So it's, it's kind of strange. I don't know if the chicken or the egg came first here, but the way I fish my flies is on a floating line specifically. And the reason being is what I talked about earlier. When my fly lands, I've got my floating line and my leader. So when my fly lands, it's going to slowly arc down to the floating line. If it's a heavier fly, it's going to go in and sink down and pull my floating line down. I prefer for my Euro nymphing, well, that's what I do when I nymph, I Euro nymph. I like having my, my floating line on top of the water as an indicator. Again, this is a me thing. I've got a lot of friends that catch three times as fish as me and they'll hold up and trout set. When I personally hold up and trout set, that sway that I get from the wind or from me I feel that I'm, I'm either moving the fly or I'm missing eats. And I, and I can't discern which it, which it is. I just know it's me. And that's just not cool. So I just realized early on that I can lay my fly line down and just use it as an indicator. And as soon as that thing ticks, moves, or makes any alien motion, I'm setting and we're off to the races. So by seeing that and working that into my favor, I was able to design flies that worked with that. Or maybe I designed flies and that made me think that way. Again, chicken, egg, I don't know. But it's a great little system. you got to have multiple. I have a two-fly system that I can hide a tight line through, through holes in the river if I have to, if I can't see fish. I've got uh, Rick Mike Self from Trouts. What's up, buddy? You're a rock star, man. I love you. 
he's I mean, you got to watch this guy with, with heavier flies and he just hammers fish. There just isn't a wrong way. There's just so many right ways to do it. You just got to get out there and find out which way is your way. So I'll use a seven to a seven and a half liter in still water. And the reason being is most of my presentations in ponds and lakes are very close and I don't need the longer leader. A lot of times that longer leader inhibits that presentation or I want to lay my fly down with a side roll cast. And now I don't want to have nine feet of foot leader out and still have to float my line. So in those still situations where things may be tighter, I prefer a shorter leader. Flip over to the river and I'll go to a nine foot leader. I do the same thing, nine foot nylon leader, lop off the bottom two feet, replace it with fluoro. Sizes and weights, zero or one X on your, your, uh, your leader. And then I carry uh, 12 and what, 15, I think pound test in my uh, in my bag. Uh, I have t- I have eight through twelve, and I think I, I use ten and twelve the most. That's what it is. Um, and I use twelve mostly in the river, and ten mostly on still. And that's just because my presentations tend to be more delicate on the still side than the river side. And that may be just moving water versus not moving water. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm casting more on the river sometimes as well. Um, and that may have a lot to do with that nine foot leader. Um, you're going to have more distance on the, on the river that you're going to want to cast. So having a little more length to present a fly, uh, I find beneficial on the river. And that was brought to my attention from Jeremy Elms, who was now in Florida, but a super carby dude that really told me that I know you love your seven to seven and a half foot leader, but pardon me, but the nine footer on the river is going to change a lot of presentations in, in how the fly actually presents itself uh, off of a mend. And, and that's really the one thing aside from casting that, that really kind of opened my mind is that your leader and the fly is really an extension of that mend. So if, if I only have X amount of distance from my fly line to leader connection and I mend that, that's less distance for that to cover on that mend. So when I have a longer fly line now, that mend has that much more distance to work, react, and swing back around. So I prefer the longer leader without question uh, on the river. But both rigs are a nylon leader with uh, the bottom two feet lopped off and replaced uh, with fluorocarbon, anywhere from 8 to 12 pound. That's here in Colorado with me. Blackfoot, Idaho, I'm doing 20 pound test. Big fish, always over 20 pounds. Um, and I found that, you know, through Gerald. Gerald Lee, I am just shouting out everywhere. I have the car, I'm driving. I mean, Sam's next to me with a break, but I'm driving at the moment. So, yeah, I, I went and fished Blackfoot with Gerald, and um, I wish I still had to text. The, it was like all caps with like ha 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 with like exclamations when I asked him if I should bring like 12 pound test um no it, they're the the big boys in big water carp you will absolutely up your game with everything your rod your fly size your leader size and that's just how the big carp game goes here in colorado the numbers i mentioned settle in really comfortably for me and again that's a different thing and i line all those up with a seven or an eight weight i prefer a six weight if i'm fishing with a friend and i have someone to help me land that fish i'll fish a six weight i can't land that six weight or i can't land a big fish on a six weight, humanely, yeah, a carp, humanely, with a six weight without either compromising the infrastructure of my rod or my elbow. It's just saying, and I'm not going to beach that fish. I just can't do it. So I'll use a six weight on my smaller ponds with smaller fish, both leader setups, be a seven and a half footer because it's a small pond. If I'm in the river, I'm going to be in a seven or eight weight glass rod, uh, same leader setup, same length, different flies. Uh, I hope that answered those questions because now it's time to talk doofus. All right. So um, I'm going to make this quick because the video itself is going to explain a lot. And I'm going to follow up. I'm going to give you this. Um, that fly wouldn't exist without Jay Zimmerman. And and Jay um, is just equally good a human being as he is uh, a, a tire and a, a fly design mind. He's been a great mentor to me from a fly tying base without a doubt. Um, I took a, ch- a class at Charlie's uh, in 2017 in January, uh, and I learned how to tie flies from Charlie Craven, and I learned how to design warm water flies on, on those basic steps and that foundation from Charlie 
from Jay. And both of those mines were under one roof for some time. It was a really fun time to go in there because no matter if I went in for trout or went in for, for warm water, I had an unbelievable library to, to talk to and to, to pull from. So yeah, uh, I, I took a class from Charlie in 2017 and that's where my foundation um, comes from. You know, everything from thread control to making sure that everything in my fly looks the right way dimensionally, you know, my proportions are right, my silhouette is right. All of those basic steps, man, that I built on, those two guys are responsible for when you look at some of my flies. So the doofus is really an interpretation of a trout fly that hammers here in our local tailwaters called the Banksia bug. And it's B-A-N-K-S-I-A, -A, Banksia. And after we're done, don't go now. After we're done, go to YouTube and search it. And there's a video of Jay tying the Banksia bug. It is a super fun tie and an unbelievable free swimming caddis uh, replication as far as a fly goes. Okay, so I was enamored with this fly. I loved it. And when you're going through these stages as a tire, we all go through this phase of thinking, well, I can make that a carp fly, or I can make that a bass fly, or I can make that, we're, we're, we're taking flies that we like within one genre and moving them over. And, and that's really like the evolution of the doofus was, I love the Banksia bug so much that I wanted to make it into a carp fly. You know, it's just, it really is how it went. So when you find the Banksia bug and you, and you look at the doofus, there's, there's, they're kissing cousins. There are definitely some similarities. But I embellished a little more because it was on the carp side. Um, it was designed, fished, and already ready to go before I finally came with the name Hipster Doofus. Um, it was named the Banksia, Cup, the Banksia uh, Bug Carp Fly. And God bless Jay. He's like, he, he told me, he's like, listen, um, I'm touched and flattered you want to name your bug after my bug. However, why don't you give that bug its own identity and, and, and name it yourself? And in hindsight, I, I'm, I'm really glad he said that because it has taken on an identity of its own in that sense. So there, when you tie the Banksia, you'll see that I've replaced certain materials with other materials that are an accessory that is an over accessory, right? Um, someone's getting ready. They're going out on a Friday night. They look in the mirror and they're like, you know what? That's one too many accessories and you downsize, you know, you can't do everything. Um, this fly is it all. There's a hot spot. There's barred wood duck. There's CDC. The, yeah, the, it, I didn't hold back on this one. What I did do is I tried to exercise moderation. I tried to balance that. I knew going in, if I'm going to over embellish this fly, I need to balance it somehow. I, it just can't be a gaudy big fly. It's just not going to work. I'm not going to pander to carp that way. Um, I respect them too much. So I had to find a way to make sure that I made this I don't know, modest, but yet overly accessorized, right? It's got one or two more than it needs. Uh, you'll often see, if you've ordered doofuses for me, or if you've gone into Anglers All or Trouts uh, or Orvis or two in Texas, you may have bought a doofus for me via those avenues. There's a rib on the Banksy bug. I don't pay attention to how I wrap the body, and I point this out in the video. So when I point out the faux rib, it's a really great way in general to kind of get a full rib on your fly without kind of thinking about adding a material. I didn't want to add a material to this fly already. It had a lot. I knew there was a way to get it done with what I had. So, all right. Jay Zimmerman is the man. He, he helped me a ton with my warm water stuff. I wouldn't have gotten those bugs tied the way I'd gotten them tied had Charlie not had fly tying classes. So I'm going to go out there right now and tell you right now, you know, Charlie and Jay, both of you are just extraordinary extraordinary people in teaching and passing on information and thank you both for what you have done no chance that i'm sitting here right now without either one of you so without further ado my baby the first bug that i started catching carp on that i've tied is the hipster doofus roll it sam Hey, my name is Daryl Akins. We're going to tie the Hipster Doofus 2022 signature pattern. We are going to start off with a tried and true 2457 in a size 8. We are going to do UTC thread and wine 
70. And we're going to tie a lift kit in with that. Now, do not thread your entire hook. We're going to be very mindful of our thread wraps, very trouty in that. We don't want to overcrowd the front end of our hook. So we're going to start off with tying a lift kit in to lift our eyes up here. And this are two bars of 0 0.30 lead cut to five millimeters. And I will leave you to your own devices on how you want to get these pinned and tied in. So they may be a little uneven, if that's possible. And you want to pretty much have just about the amount of thread you need for this bad boy, which is about four or five millimeters. And we're going to tie these in right behind our hook eye. It doesn't take much just to grab them and then do a couple loose spiral wraps so you can move them around. And what we really want is we want the eyes to be on top of the hook shank rather than on the side of the hook shank. So really concentrate on keeping those bars together and then sitting on the hook shank rather than sitting on the hook shank and then going together. And that's going to ensure the height that we want, uh, which is why we have the 0 0.30 lead is because the 0 0.20 lead doesn't give us the same diameter and which will give us a lower fly just by enough. And it makes a difference. So I applied some Loon water-based glue, which is a very flexible glue. It rivals Zap in certain categories. If you have both Zap and water-based glue, your flies will be very strong. You can use them where their strengths lie. Um, zap -a gap is great this way. It's not so much this way. And that's what this is going to move if it gets hit. The water-based glue is actually flexible. So this, this head will flex before it ever cracks and breaks. And the reason we did the loose wraps back is because now that glue got in between our lift kit and around the hook shank before we sealed it in with thread. So now we just got a very nice balanced uh, lift kit here on our fly. And if you ever want to find out if it's exactly on top, you can turn your fly upside down and look at the hook point to the hook shank and see if it happens to be cattywampus or not. And you can nudge it and then tie it in and tighten it. So now that we're happy with where the lift kit lies, you're going to wrap your thread back half hitch it, lose it, and we're gonna move on to the same color wine, but in 140. And we just need a, a, a heftier thread because we're gonna get physical when we tie our eyes in. So you wanna mount your eyes behind the front of the lift kit by approximately a, a millimeter, I would say. What we wanna do is we wanna allow enough space in the front here to build the head once we get there. If we don't, what's going to happen is the fly will end up getting not only crowded, but bulky. So by leaving enough room to finish up front, we will have balance from the rear to the front of the fly. So I really like to keep my movement of these eyes to a minimum. I'm going to tie them in where the movement, I'm going to say, if you were looking at, you know, the pie graph, we're going to keep within a very small percentage to where I can nudge them left or right by almost wrenching it with thread. So I can pull this in now and move my eyes in. And now on this thread wrap, the other side of the X wrap, I can inline, move them back. And I'm always going to tip my fly upside down because that allows me now to see exactly where that's sitting. And before I wrench and tie those in, it's good to make any adjustments that you're going to need. So what I do for that is we're all familiar with the over the hook shank and under the eyes. And then we're going to do one more bit of glue here before we finish up. So you want to make sure that you don't go too far because otherwise you're going to have too much thread for the glue to go down in. We want to make sure that when we apply our glue, we can see that it puddles and we can see just enough glue on the thread wrap there. And that lets us know that everything got down and there's still some glue left over. And that leftover glue we are going to absorb back up with the new dry thread. Sit. All right. So we're going to wrap some thread back. That's our body. Half hitch, kill it, and then we're going to go back to our 70. All right. We're going to start about right there. And we're going to start building our body. We're going to do this one in fluorescent orange and brown. This is Senya Laser Dub. You can do any color combo. There's, gosh, lots of colors of Senya out there or any long fiber dubbing would work. I've used monster dub in the past as well. But Senyo is where it is right now because that is what I started with and I have no problem with it. It is very consistent. Now you can see the end here 
That's fine, we'll get to it. I don't want to have a super long dubbing loop, so I just leave what I need at the bottom, and we'll address that when we get there. So think about making a small football over a stretch of about five millimeters on the back of this fly, because the abdomen will finish up right around five millimeters. Here's our section that we had left over. I can just pull that down now, uh, wet my fingers. I have a sponge. It's actually a soldering sponge, but it's just a small sponge with water rather than licking. One, I didn't want to lick a bunch of flies and then mail them off to people ordering my flies. Yuck. And two, I didn't want to put materials back in my mouth. Hashtag dad moment. So uh, the, the sponge seemed pretty logical to me. So we're going to keep going here with, with rope after rope. Keep the dubbing rope thin enough, sparse enough, I should say, to where you can still see the wine thread through your rope. And that way you'll know that you can pretty much paint that thorax and bury those thread wraps in with each wrap because it's thin enough to do so. And you'll notice I'll work over and then come back down and work over and then come back down. And what we're doing is we're building that taper. You don't always have to come back down or else you would just, you would overbuild it. But when I want to do a turnaround, I'll come down and build a little of that taper and then do a loose spiral to get back over to the abdomen there. And you can see it's starting to take shape there. And if you start getting thread wraps that are too big, you'll start seeing it kind of almost bubble on you and want to roll off. Uh, it'll still fish, but you'll also notice that at the end of like three or four fish, you'll start seeing the, the, the dubbing start kind of tearing and pulling off. So this will keep things really durable for you by keeping the dubbing rope sparse. Now there isn't a rib on this fly and we're going to actually use this yellow or the, the brighter color, the hot spot color, if you will, of uh, your color combo as the underbelly of the faux rib. This bug was inspired by the Banksia bug, which is a UV pattern that's a free swimming caddis. And it does have a rib on there, it has a double rib. Super fun tie, as well as productive. So that's what this fly is modeled after. I didn't think it was gonna be practical, given the, uh, ooh, given the actual design of the fly as it stood, to put a rib in there. It just wasn't, wasn't gonna work. So I used the under color as a faux rib when I wrapped the darker color or the contrasting color back over it. All right, that is super close. I bet you will probably just one away, one away. We're, what you're looking for there is about four millimeters. And after this wrap, I think I will be there. Oh yeah, this is looking good. So check this out. What we're going to do, one of the most important and annoyingly important tools that I ever added was a ruler. Um, whether I'm measuring how long a dubbing loop is or how long a fly is or a tail or how wide a body may be, I can look at this and, and know that I'm within the constraints of what I need this fly to be for balance. Um, so pick yourself up, you know, it's a few bucks and it will be one of your best friends on your bench. So we're going to switch up to our contrast color. Uh, the other version of the doofus that will be available is a fluorescent orange and olive uh, combo, which is super productive. All right, so when I go back now, let me explain what I'm going to do here. I'm not going to concentrate on making this opaque by any stretch. I want to make sure that I have a casual miss. So don't try and like put a full wrap in there. Just wrap it back and you're going to naturally have a miss or two in there to be able to have some of our underneath crack through. And that little hot spot, that little bit of faux rib, I'm cool with that. It's exactly what we need. Uh, so we're going to leave about, see that little bit of, little bit of wine thread creeping through there. That's where we're going to put our two feathers, uh, or CDC rather, and our wood duck. Now I just took that little bit of dubbing off. It was another full wrap, but I didn't want another full wrap of dubbing. It just wasn't necessary. And as crazy as that sounds, we don't want the unnecessary buildup. We're going to apply a little wood duck to this bad boy. You pull, so you can make these as wide or as big as you like, right? When you pull them off. But I actually counted and I want to say there's four or five barbels in there. 
right in that area of our zone of feathers. And if you dig a longer feather, then you could time longer. I do tend to keep in that four to five millimeter zone. There we go. I see what you're doing. There we go. You know, it's important to make sure that you're happy before you move ahead with it, because if you're not, oh, you see that? It's not going to get me. Nope. There we go. I'm a real guy tying fake bugs. It happens. All right, cool. So we're going to do a modified X wrap or a Y wrap. And we're going to be able to go around this thing a couple times and secure our uh, our eyes in a little better, or our, our feathers in a little better here. This wood duck can possibly get pulled out with several fish. We're going to pivot off of our hook eye, go under each eye, come up from behind, over the top of the eye, under your hook eye, go back around, grab this feather, come back around, and then pivot off of that and then over that eye. And then one wrap behind. And now what we've done is we've created two loops that just went around each feather and came back over the eye. And then what we have is just double over-engineered feathers. Now, we're one step away. We're going to do a little dubbing loop of CDC. This is another one of those refined moves. Uh, it used to be a full CD fe CDC feather that I just tied and wrapped. And it just got too tough to, to accommodate so much space being eaten by the, the stem of the feather with wanting to keep the, the, the taper intact. So I went to the dubbing loop method, and this is much cleaner uh, on the front end of this fly. So what we're going to do is we're not going to take our dubbing loop and, and we're not going to build it behind the eyes perpendicular to the fly. We're actually going to build it diagonally over the eyes this way. So we put our bulk here and not here because we still have a, with a wrap it and we don't want to have the bulk of building it and wrapping it. So we're going to go over the top, swing it around a couple of times, cinch it on top, bring it over and grab it with two wraps in the back and it's locked in. Do now is we're going to grab a little bit of wax. This wax is no more than like a helping hand. It's just enough to kind of help keep those CDC feathers from CDC feathers from getting a little bit of wonky on you and going crazy. All right. Get these as close to the tip of your dubbing loop as possible. If you put your feathers in up here, then you're going to have to wrap at least three times this much thread over around before you even get to your feathers. So the, the, the closer you can get those feathers to the, the tip of your loop, uh, the more production you're going to get as far as feathers to thread ratio on this fly. I like to grab right behind what I'm going to spin. This, there's two ways to go about that. This preloads what we're going to do. Um, I'm able to do this. That little bit of wax is going to help these bad boys stay in place and not go anywhere. If you just spin it, it's going to spin and grab together. This is going to allow it to spin a lot quicker and grab it right away. And now we're just going to wrap. The only difference is we're not going to wrap just perpendicular to the fly. We're going to wrap with forward pressure so that way our thread wraps are up against the eyes this way and the, the material push back. And then again, I'm going to finish on the top there. All right, let's get some thread management. Now you'll notice I, I upgraded my fly there. You know, it's not necessary, but sometimes when you're going in and you're building the head, sometimes it's just better to have the fly upright. You can bite things off. Gravity's working with you and not against you in a different direction. Uh, here's where the zap comes in. Actually, let's make sure that we're not going to zap any CDC. What do we have here? Okay. So I'm not going to use a ton. I'm going to use, what, a half-inch swipe or so, um, just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with here. That is a quarter of an inch, and that, just a quarter inch of zap. We'll go around this hook shank. One, two, three. So I got three wraps of thread with zap a gap. And we know if we use zap, we can half hitch and cut this, and we'd still have to cut it off with a razor blade, which is pretty encouraging. 
So if we're going to over-engineer it, we might as well do it on the head. So we leave everything empty so we can actually overbuild on top of what's not going to come undone. So we built the head on top of the zap and, and the whips underneath. Uh, and then you're, you're good to go. This thing is indestructible. So what you're going to get now is a really nice translucency uh, with the CDC. What you want your wood duct to start doing is what it's doing now, is to separate and kind of become one of its own. This adds individuality and personality in each thing. I always look at these things as fingerprint qualities. We all have different fingerprints. That's what makes us individuals. Uh, whenever you can make parts of our bugs that we're giving these fish every day, if we can make these things imperfect in the smallest, just the smallest ways, uh, I think we're winning as far as presenting a fly that puts, her, puts it in the maybe column rather than the yes or the no column. I think we do ourselves a waste of energy or a disservice if we start focusing too much on the yes and the no. I mean, all a fish has to do is say maybe, and they're going to give it a shot if they want to expend the calories to eat it, right? We know that math. So I'm big on the maybe. So this stuff here you want, you know, you'll notice in some of the other flies when I, when I get in there and I brush over my feathers, I'm really looking to like disrupt, disrupt every individual part of that feather. So there's an individuality to it and water hits every part of it differently. Uh, so yeah, that's the hipster doofus. Uh, it is an umpqua signature pattern. It's going to be in your bins in your fly shop in 2022. Tie a bunch up or buy a bunch. Hipster doofus, right? All right, so I love tying the fly. It's my baby. I'm completely biased. Um, there's some really cool things that you can kind of t transfer over to other tying applications or bugs, genres. Uh, that I did uh, in this tie. Um, I, I want you to notice that I also, did, you know, very similar to what Lance did. There was a point where I didn't make the the spite turn or ah, it's just a little bit of dubbing. What's it gonna What's it gonna matter? Turn. We all do it. I, I I'm guilty of those things. I have to be diligent on particular patterns and flies because I know that I have a lot going on up there. And if I overcompensate somewhere, I have to compromise something else. So I tied, oh my gosh, I, I guess it's fair to say hundreds, but it would have to be pretty darn close to thousands at this point of the doofus to where I know what I need to do in the front of the fly. And this goes with anybody with any of their own patterns. When you tie it enough, you know that you've gone too far if you've done this, right? So you kind of know what your your boundaries are. So the, the doofus is critically balanced as far as how it's built. You have to look logically that I'm building a pretty big abdomen on a fly that's on the, the tail end of the fly and the, the head's on the other end. So when you look at those, those are, those are very abstract from each other. So the bigger you make your abdomen, the less it's going to really want to turn over because you're counterweighting the opposite way. That's why I keep the abdomen right around that four millimeter range is because anything bigger than that and you start working against what the lift kit does. And I'm going to go really briefly on lift kits before we go on to set up uh, our next fly and answer the questions. Lift kits are designed to do one thing, right? It's, it's really designed to make the top end of the fly unstable. Um, if you buy... This book right here from Jay Zimmerman, you will learn everything that I know, okay? I, I, I studied this book. He has been graciously, I mean, unbelievably, like, helpful in this book and giving lots of information that it took time for him to get. I've taken that information and basically unknowingly expounded upon it and kind of found things that I can build within and on top of what he's already provided. So I can't, I, I, I just really can't tell you how helpful this book was. On top of taking a class from Charlie Craven and then going in and talking to Jay Zimmerman day after day and Jay stopping what he was doing to build a UV head with me or to show me what a lift kit really does or what tail drag means are invaluable lessons that I learned at my local fly shop. Walked around, I, I, I drove five minutes from my house. so. It's, I'm fortunate, right? This is gonna have a lot of information in it on how to really start getting you on the right road to thinking about how to design a car fly that you can then have a platform 
to build on and, and create an identity for yourself on different flies by using lift kits, by using reverse weighting. Lots of cool tricks in this. Um, when you learn to tie the backstabber and you trim, there is a very distinct reason what side Jay trims and why. And I'm not going to give it up. It's in there. And it's a, an extremely valuable piece of tying information. Okay. So the two is a balanced fly. And that's my point that the, the back end is around four millimeters. And I, and I have tied it smaller. But for the most part, if you keep that back end within the constraints of where it needs to be, you'll have a really good balanced fly. The lift kit on that, man, Jay was just brilliant. What I did is I took the lift kit that he had talked about and cut it in half and then up the diameter. When I do a lift kit, it's tough to say it's not about the weight because I'm using lead wire, okay? Let me describe it this way. The weight of the fly or the weight that the lift kit brings to the fly is in the car. But it's not driving. It may be it may be riding shotgun, but the weight that this brings to the lift kit is not driving the car. What's driving the car is the diameter of the lead. Okay, so the thirty versus the twenty. Right. If I were to do a, a longer length of the twenty, I didn't get the height from the diameter of the thirty. So what I did is I weighed out both. I took 30, I cut it in half and brought it down to four millimeters. And all of a sudden, by cutting the lift kit in half, I got the diameter I wanted and I had the same weight. Don't be afraid to experiment. Don't be afraid to have little tools. Pardon me. Like this right here, okay? And this is in Jay's book and I thought he was a wackadoodle, but all this is is a scale. And I now know them by heart. I can tell you a dozen of my flies and tell you what they weigh within a fifth of a gram. And that's not bragging. That's just once you know what your flies weigh and you get to a consistent point, you can look at a fly and go, that's going to weigh 0.34 to 0.35 of a gram, fifth of a gram. That's just how it's going to go. I, I weighed all my eyes. I weighed all my lead eyes. I weighed my bead eyes. I can tell you what the brassy eyes versus the lead eyes were. If I wanted to tie a fly that had bead chain eyes, but I wanted to move over to lead eyes, the midget lead eyes weigh the same as bead chain eyes. What's the difference? Lead has more mass. So I'm going to get a little more of a sink rate on my lead eyes than I'm going to get on the bead chain eyes because there is hollow metal. I'm hoarse. I work at a fly shop. So I talk all day. I'm sorry. But yes. You look at the science of it, it's just mass. Mass is going to sink faster. So there's more mass in those lead eyes. Even though they weigh the same, they're going to sink faster. So if I'm tying a fly like a doofus for the river, I'll use midget lead. The fly doesn't change any weight, and I get more sink rate. So something like this, like a little scale, can just completely blow open your fly tying as far as keeping things accurate and knowing what your fly is doing when it breaks the surface. Everything on, on my carp side was really fueled by tying Euro nymphing flies. I got into Euro nymphing and I realized that I can tie flies for my weight and I can have different weight flies by what size tungsten bead I had. And I was controlling my depth by weight. If I didn't have a jig hook, I could take a slot of bead and roll it to the, where the majority of the weight from the slot of bead was above the hook shank. And you tie in a few jam wraps of thread. Now, all of a sudden, a straight nymph hook rolls over and rides hook up. When I saw that, I was doing all these things on the Euro nymphing side before I got into tying carp. You ever watch the Karate Kid? He's always telling Daniel to paint the fence, to wax the car, to sand the deck. And then Daniel's, he, he, he gets frustrated. I'm, not, I'm tired of doing all this work for you. He had no idea that he was training to fight, right? Sand on, and wax on, wax. I had no idea that everything that I was doing on the Euro nymphing side worked over to the carp side because I was working, controlling weight, watching my wraps and keeping my silhouette in check. And most importantly, depth control. So by learning to turn hooks over where my, where my fly was sinking, how fast and where it was in the, in the water column were all things that I had unknowingly just ingrained in my tying 
vocabulary. So when I started tying carp flies, it was only natural. When I started reading Jay's book, it's like, this makes complete sense. I, I get that. That, that, yeah, I'm picking up what you're laying down. So yeah, I went and I bought a scale and I weighed every damn fly that I tied. Every, if I tied 12 flies, I weighed them all. And the ones that didn't fall in to the weight that I was really f going for, I tried to break down and find out why. What, at what point in this process did I add extra material to increase the weight? Was the, did I not measure the lift kit? I know it sounds crazy, but even for a casual tire, your flies are going to be more consistent. If we can't see our fly below the surface of the water, and let me be the first one to break the bad news to you. If you're fly, fly fishing for carp, it's going to happen. You're not always going to see. It's not always that way. So if I can't see my fly. I need to trust that all the work I put into the vise is doing what it's supposed to do when, it, when it's out of my sight. Trust your weights. Make sure your weights are on point. Field test your flies. Don't drop them in a little bit of water, okay? This And this is something that's just not really paid attention to. If you fish your fly in two feet of water, then you need to troubleshoot your fly in two feet of water. If you fish your fly in a glass of water, which is what, six, eight inches, test your water, your flies. You, you go around, you see where I'm going? Make sure that where you test your fly, there's enough depth to give physics enough time to work. We're not tying our fly with heavy eyes to turn over and just go to the bottom and have gravity work. We're not working with gravity. Gravity's in the car. It's shotgun. Physics is driving the car. We want to move it up, make it unstable, and have that rollover. So that's what a lift kit does. You're lifting and making that fly unstable and have it roll over. And that's where you get your flies to actually work for you subsurface. All right. We'll touch on that again a little later. Who's ready for some meat? All right. So I have recently done a handful of orders that I've sent to South America. So I am in the vein of big predator flies at the moment. It's all on my mind. I do a lot of bucktail work. I love big flies. I know Steve Maldonado personally, and this guy can tie some bucks. He's all over the – I mean, he's versatile. He can tie it all. The Jungle Junkie, which is what we're about to watch – So, okay, so I had, let me, let me just find it. I had all this information prepared for you. I don't know if I can really re replace it. I had texts come into me from guides that fished his fly. And basically, everything that they wrote me is along the lines of Piranha ate the fly and chewed it in half, leaving only the head, and Dorado still hammered it, eating only the head of the fly. So, I can tell you a bunch of things about this fly. I really, I, I can go on about it. But if the fact that a piranha ate it in half and they only fished the head and they were still crushing Dorado, I'm going to quote Sam and say that I think that speaks for itself, right? I think it's a pretty damn good fly. So no further ado, Steve Maldonado, Colorado um, local native. I know the guy. He's super fishy. He ties some really, really nice nice bugs this is his jungle junkie steve maldonado umqua signature tire and i'm going to be throwing down my jungle junkie let's do it Start with a little touch of super glue on the hook. And I got Semper Fly 3 yacht 200 denier. Start about a couple of hook links back, eye links back of the. You don't want to go too far back with this at all. It's an easy fly to tie, doesn't take up a lot of room. We're going to start with some bucktail. Chartreuse. I'm going to pick the tail right down here that doesn't flare a lot. I don't want it to flare as much as uh, the more hollow hair up higher. Take a pretty good clump. Get 
get all the under fur out of it. Square it off a little bit. It's about the length I want. I'm going to spin my thread clockwise to rope it a little bit. Really loose turn. Just drive you that hair all the way around. Lock it down. Just a little bit of flare, that's what you want right there. Cinch it all down. Always put a little super glue on it. These flies take a beating for pike, peacock, bass, stuff like that. I don't want them coming apart. Now I've got some flashaboo. And this isn't the Magnum. This is just the standard flashaboo fire tiger. Take a pretty good clump of this. What's it? About a half a pencil width. Old people call it. And I don't want it cut square, so I'm going to feather it out. And I always comb it just to make sure that it's uh, all the fibers are free. I'm going to go about 60 40 on this. Want that to come past that bucktail about right there. There again, loose wrap. Get it around. Get my little Sportsman's Warehouse pencil. You just try to clear it all out. You can kind of wrap it any time, but I just like it a little bit neater. Pinch right there. Make sure it's distributed all the way around. It's a really simple fly. Not a lot to it. Cast like a bullet. Lash that down. Touch of super glue. Got a little Senyo's laser dub. It's gonna have yellow covered with a an orange throat. Just even up the fibers on this, they get knotted up pretty good. You want to be careful with this. You don't want to use too much. It's easy to put too much on there and it just doesn't swim right. Wrap, make sure it's secured on the bottom. Then on the top, we're going to go with uh, just straight olive, Senyo's laser dub. I like it because it's got a little purple speck in there in the water. It looks pretty awesome. There again, get all your fibers even. Couple wraps, peel it back. Couple of wraps in front. We'll get it all brushed out at the end. So now we're going to go with orange on the throat. Laser dub, fluorescent hot orange. This again has a little bit of purple in it. Looks fantastic.
couple of wraps there. Hold it in place. A little bit of the olive on top. A little too much there. This should put on about 50-50, 60-40. Just, there we go. Get a good head. What I'll do here is take a Copic marker. Color that thread up a little bit. Fluorescent orange. Whip finish. Give her a little brush. It's a super simple fly. But you do want to brush it. Not skip that step. Brush it good. Here we go. Now we're down to the Brule Outdoors eyes. I like the gold on this, it really makes it pop. I like using the Loctite gel. It really holds these eyes on good. Pretty good put clump on there. Now I have uh, put a clamp on here and got these eyes where they're really squeezed together. Uh, but it doesn't swim as, as good when you do that. If you look at that, get a little hydraulic over there. Get a little water push over them eyes like that if you don't squeeze them together. And that tail really, it just really helps it swim a lot better without doing that. And that's it. And then for the hook, we use these... Uh, TMC 600 SPs and a 4 aught. It's just a wicked hook. Uh, this is made for pike, uh, uh, peacock bass, uh, Dorado. Uh, it's it's a jungle fly uh, that was initially uh, meant as a pike fly that turned into uh, something a lot bigger. Easy fly to throw, not a lot of materials, and uh, it just it really really catches a lot of fish. And um, from the texts I got from the guys down in South America, yeah, it catches a lot of fish. Hey, uh, so everyone out there here at YouTube, Charlie's here. So can we get a bunch of like emoji applauses and everybody welcome Charlie. We all know Charlie. Charlie taught me how to tie flies. Charlie, welcome to the chat. Thank you. And yes, I will stop by. I will make a triple espresso just for you, and I will bring a, a new animated level to your next tie, fly tying video. You never know what it may be. Look, I even got a guitar because people are talking guitars. Okay. So, I'll put that down. Okay. So, I want to point out a few things that Steve did on that fly. Um, when you look at predator flies, it's a little different than the smaller streamer game. He, Fish go into a predatorial state, like right when you start looking at fish like brownies that, that chase down flies, right? And then you can start going up the fish line, if you will, as far as predatory behavior. And 
the more vicious the fish get, we all know that they're going to hit broadside and most times right at the head, um, which is probably why Steve's fly fishes so well, even after it's been chomped in half, is because there's enough definition, water push, and life happening from what he built in the front end of that to push water around to still create something that the fish wants to smash. And that really does come down to design. Um, I love bucktail. I love tying with bucktail, but there are so many better tires than me with bucktail. So my opinion is going to be in the middle of the pack um, to, to better tires. Now, and, and I say that because I don't want to undermine any of the hard work that they've done. Um, you know, a lot of my bucktails are deceivers and a, a combination of either hollow ties or reverse ties or just straight up deceivers, um, mostly all bucktail. Recently, I've had a couple of orders go down to South America. I mentioned that prior. So I knew that I could see what Steve was doing and kind of dial in on that for these orders that were going down. Um, you have to kind of think differently when you're tying flies that are going somewhere that you haven't been and for fish that you haven't really tied for. So at the end of the day, you really have to make sure that you're paying attention to the big picture and you, you, you check your ego to the side of the vice and you, you, you tie for the moment, for the place, and for the fish. So when I tie predator flies, um, I've gotten away, and this is a bucktail reason. This is not a philosophy by any stretch. I'm not anti-articulated flies by any stretch. However, um, when I learned to tie with bucktail, I found out that I could get the same motion and articulation and movement uh, by stacking and building mass without weight and tapering and having that water aerodynamically move over the fly and push to the back and move. Now, if this were just a straight bucktail deceiver, I'm going to make sure that the front end of my fly has all the mass. So it's pushing through the water to create push. Now, we know the word or the term aerodynamic, right? So if you think hydronamically, right, same thing. If you were in your car, water hits your windshield, it pushes up and it would fly off. Think about how you build. You want the water to hit the front of your fly and push. And then the taper will dictate how the water rolls off your fly. Your taper's too long, the water will actually shoot and roll off the taper and pass your tail. So you wanna make sure that your tapers are in line so when the water moves off of your taper, it's hitting the tail, whether that be bucktail, whether it's flash, whether it's a wiggle tail. Doesn't matter what your tail is. Make sure that your, your taper gives you a chance to move that fly. All of this bucktail is going to breathe and move, and it's just going to really feel and look like a, re a real fish when it's in the water. So having a proper taper is going to help. Keeping everything at the head of the fly where the predator hits is the second thing. I, and, and this is the reason why I went to one hook. On smaller trout predator flies, if I'm, if I'm tying brown trout-like flies, I'll do a... a, 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 a Absolutely, we'll do an articulated fly. Um, just because you can do a smaller fly, small hooks, and really handle some big brown trout and keep a really good sexy taper, i.e. Kelly Gal, right? He is the king of like really, really nice, small and mid-sized streamers for trout. Love his designs. This is going to be on the, like the one step bigger predator side where we're moving to one hook. It's all on the head. We know this fly is going to move, 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 move. And when it broadens up, that's when the predator hits, and that's where the head of the fly is going to live. And I think that's why Steve's fly has such a lifespan, is that even though the, the back half of it was eaten, the front half was still pushing water, and it was still attracting fish, and they were still eating it at half. And you can do a lot of different things. So this is the hairline wiggle tail that I have on there now. I have some with mono straights. I don't know where that one is. I apologize. Oh, is that it? Here we go. This is a demo fly, so you're not supposed to see this. But you can see, I used a mono straight on here, and it's the same thing. Instead of the contraption that I'm working on now, 
I would have a wiggle tail connected to that. And this mono straight is nothing more than 60 pound mono, right? 60 pound mono. Cut them in six to eight inch lengths, all right? And, and put them through a pen tube. Boil water, put said tube in the water. The warm water is gonna straighten out the memory from your trilene from, or whatever brand you buy for that 60 pound. Then you can take those, double them over, play them single, tie them in single, and make extensions off your, your long predator flies. You can tie beast flies this way and tie your bucktail off and extend the tail off your fly. You can put a wiggle tail, a flash tail, or a spinner. So there are multiple ways to build in movement to a fly without having to add an extra hook. And on the predator end, bigger, bigger, bigger fish. We're talking 15, 20 pounds. Mean fish, jumping, moving, running. The, looking at a compromise in the signal flow of, of your rig, I think it's reasonable to say that 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 second hook is a compromise. No matter how well it's tied in, how well it's glued in, it's a compromise. So having one hook lowers your odds of failure. And they're going to hit it right there anyway. That's where they're eating that fly. So Steve's got it going on. He knows what he's doing. Every color of that fly, by the way, is juvenile peacock. I mean, whoa, he's like, he, he's thinking, he knows he's a thinking man's tire. So when you look at predator flies, key in not on things that trigger fish, but just tie the bait fish they're going to eat. You know, if, if they're eating smaller Dorado, if they're eating smaller peacocks, tie that. This fire tiger was just something to put it in the ballpark of a peacock. You know, fire tiger is fire tiger. We know what it is, you know. But that's all that's doing is the trigger color patterns. I don't really want this fish to look at this and go, that's a baby peacock. I want it to look at that and go, that's something I eat all the time because it looks like something I eat all the time. I can switch this around and make the red chartreuse and the chartreuse red, and it will fish the same. But you got to make sure you're pushing water, you're building mass, you're creating a light fly, and most importantly, a big hook i'm going to do a shameless plug here and i do apologize but this is the umpwa x series beast hook and i can't speak enough about this thing this thing is just brawny and big and a great deceiver hook it gives you enough length to tie on both your wiggle hook or your wiggle shank or a flash tail as well as about four stages of bucktail which will give you a tail a shoulder or a wing depending on how you want to approach it and then two bulkheads in the front to build some mass. The, I mean, it's just a great hook. It's sized perfectly for some of these predator flies when you're looking to tie predator fish or fish for predator fish. All right. I could probably grab a few more flies, but I don't want to steal thunder. Let me throw that back there. Throw that there. And don't be afraid to like experiment with even smaller wiggle tails. I have, uh, I tie small bass flies, you know, take that predator idea and take that and just shrink it down. They make all that stuff smaller. Um, I love tying little bass bucktail flies. So check this out. If I hide the wiggle tail on this, that's just a little bucktail bass fly. It's bucktail, it's some ostrich, it's some flash. However, when you add a wiggle tail to this, all of a sudden you've got a vibration that isn't really ever present in this fly and i have an audio background and I'm, I'm i'm pretty big on vibration subsurface so anytime i can add that vibration to a fly uh, i'm going to do that for sure no question all right next up pops chad daniel roberts this is a really cool story like one of those like heartfelt flies that you want to fish he answered a, a problem. He, he had a question. I, I need this fly. I need a shad this size. I need to look like that. He has old school influence in this, this, this particular shad pattern. And it's named after his pops or his, his granddad, who they called pops. It's pop shad, right? That we're doing. So the pink cheeks, apparently, from what I'm told, are pretty darn important. So pay attention in this video as to when he talks about those, those pink cheeks. And this is a multi, multi-species, although it was tied for specifically what he, it catches 
fish. It's just a, it's a, it's a bait fish, right? And as long as you know how to fish a bait fish, fish eat fish. So without further ado, Pops, this one's for you. This is Pops Shad. What's up, everybody? We're gonna tie some flies today. This is the new pattern coming out um, for Umqua in fall 2021. This is my fly called Pops Shad. The hook that I'm actually gonna tie with today, it's the Umqua X series. It's the XS420 in a size two. If you want something with a little bit of wider gap, I like the XS415. This is a sweet hook. And then if you need something really heavy, um, you can use the XS415H. This is the heavier um, gauge wire version of the XS415. So I like using this one for the really big stripers. Um, or if I don't want to add any lead on my fly, um, then you can actually add just use this hook uh, and it'll sink it about the same as you would with adding a little bit of lead on the shankier hook. For thread, again, a lot of variations here. You can use really whatever you want um, as long as it's a natural color. I like using a 210 um, from UTC. The stuff is super strong. Layer of thread. So I'm going to put just a little guard behind or on the bottom side of my marabou on the tail. That's really just so it won't spin around the hook um, or around the bend of the hook quite as bad. You'll see it's kind of got a natural curve to it. So what I like to do is actually just line it up and basically have that curve going outwards and then I'll tie it flat on top. So you get it in on one side and then you can see it kind of kind of forms a natural shape like that. So I'm actually going to bend it around the side and then line it up exactly with that other side. And then kind of bend it up a little bit and I'll make a couple wraps underneath it as well. And that'll just kind of, that'll make it stand up nicely. Here's what I think is probably one of the more important parts of this fly, it's the selection of marabou. You can use either a pearl gray or you can use a shad gray. The shad gray is a little bit darker. It matches up better with this, with this brush that we're gonna be using. Um, but if you want a little lighter one, you can go with the pearl gray. I know what a lot of people like to do is, um, you know, you get your feather, you brush it back, you tie it in. That's generally not what you want to do with this fly. If you do that and you keep the stem in, one, it's going to trap a lot more air. Um, it's going to take longer to sink. And then you're going to end up having to add more weight to the fly that you don't necessarily need to do. It'll also all kind of clump together and it won't work independently quite as well. So you want to find a good wide bodied feather that has a nice plume to it. And then what I like to do is basically just take it along the sides and pull, pull those feathers off of there and then try to line up the ends of them to where that's pretty much what you're left with. And then tie it in at the back. It kind of same procedure here, just grip it. and rip it. Same deal here. And you can kind of stretch those out a little bit. So the next step, um, I'm gonna just use silver flash of boot. Just take one full strand And I like to cut it in half. 
and then I'm just going to bend it over the thread just like that. It actually gives you a nice little connection point. Same kind of deal. I'm just going to bend it over the thread and then pinch it on either side. So that's going to be your flash. Don't need a lot of flash on this fly for sure. You can put a lot in there. You don't have to though. Um, body of the fly. This is real simple. These EP brushes, the one that I'm using for this fly is the inch and a half minnow head. And this is the minnow gray color. What you'll want off of this brush is about a two inch section. Um, that's going to get you through pretty much this entire fly. And they actually, they come off pretty thick. So what I like to do is just take them and just thin them out a little bit. But if you just take them and uh, thin it out that way, then it'll make it a little bit more manageable and you won't have to do as much thinning kind of in the end. So uh, basics on this one. You're going to take one end of it and you want to pull just a hair bit of that stuff off of there, expose a little bit of that wire and then tie it in at the back and then do a little half hitch. Take your little hackle pliers and then just start to, you'll have to kind of brush it back a little bit at a time as you're pulling it forward. You may not get it right the first time, every time you do this, um, but the way you want it to end is about like that. So when you're basically done with this, you want it to be right at the eye of the hook. That way, all you have to do is make a wrap over that wire and then just secure it down. So the shaping portion of this, I like using a little welder's brush. So these steel bristles uh, will hold up a lot longer and they'll kind of pull out the things that a toothbrush can't always get. And then I like to basically put this fly into four parts. Um, you got the two sides and then the top and the bottom. So you're gonna, you're gonna kind of pull out and form each side and then same deal on the top and then same deal on the bottom. So let's see if I can show that to y'all. That's kind of what you're looking for. This is a really good technique that I've kind of figured out for shaping. It just keeps things separated, which is sort of what you want when you're trying to shape down to a specific angle. Um, so you're really just going to take your scissors and go along the edge of the eye of the hook and just make a cut. Same deal on the other side. And then the top, you just kind of want to go at an angle up. Same deal on the bottom. You basically want to be aiming towards the point of that hook and then brush it back down. This is now your shad shape. Um, so we're gonna put the, the gills or whatever you wanna call them on there. I use the Ice Dub UV Fluorescent Hot Pink. If you've heard anything from Henry Cowan, you know that your striper flies have gotta have pink on them. Um, so what I do, I just take a little clump of this stuff and you just kind of pick it apart until you get it lined up on the back end and you're just going to line it up along the sides. Make a wrap. Same kind of deal here on the other side. And for the top of this stuff, I like to use the Ice Dub UV Gray. This is going to be basically the back of that fly. So again, you just pull out a nice section and you're actually just going to kind of pick it apart like you did 
And it's really, this stuff is easy to tie in if you start to pinch it in the middle. It'll give you a really nice tie in point. And then you're just going to lay this up on top, make a couple wraps. So this is now the part you're going to bend everything back over itself. It's all the little gills and that top, and then you're going to make a couple wraps over it. So that's kind of what you're wanting to get out of there. Wrap it up in front, make a whip finish. So now kind of the next portion of shaping. I like to cut off some of this back and just thin it out. This is gonna be a little thicker one, but that's okay. And then again, kind of on the bottom. I generally like these flies to be a little thinner. I use a uh, quarter inch WTP eyes. I like using the glow in the dark ones. You can also use the silver ones. So all I'm gonna do is just put a little bit of the Loctite on the back of it. And then the idea is you basically want that eye to sit right behind the eye of the fly or the eye of the hook. And you're just gonna press it in there. Same deal on the other side. So at this stage, I would actually epoxy the gaps in the top and on the bottom. But now that I've got my eyes on, Make my little final cuts here. Start to really shape it down. It's really one other step. It's, and this is optional, just depending on what you're trying to match. I'm trying to match a thread fin shad, so I'm gonna actually put a little black dot with one of these Prisma markers. And that's it. That is the Pops Shad. So yeah, hope that helps and hope you guys get out there and fish some. Thank you. All right, so I have to point out a few things straight out of the gate. So when you look at a fly that looks simple and easy there's often a few tricks hidden within that that make it a little more intricate or well thought out so let me point out a few things that 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 that, it, that he does here so when 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 daniel he references the hook i can't point that out enough that's not something that is going to change so the relative angle or plane that your hook is on is the hook plane so if you tie relative to the hook eye that's a fixed position right you're not moving your eyes up and tying to that position you're in your tying position you're looking at the hook eye to the hook shank and that's your relative plane so when you tie an eye in or you glue an eye in on a bigger eye like that or fly like that the first thing i'm doing is i have to i have to complete i always call this the alley -oop. one side of the head is the alley the other side the other eye is the oop and they really can't work independently. An alley-oop is a team effort, right? So I have to make sure that first eye is completely where I want it to be in perpendicular to the hook shank and the hook eye, but how above or below the hook shank do I want it, right? So when, when, when Daniel's tying that fly, he absolutely knows that he has a really relative angle with the hook shank and the hook eye as long as he's always in tying position that he can go off of. It's not gonna change. So as long as you don't tie your or change your tying position, you're going to have a pretty stable relative angle to work from. So once you get that first eye in, he turns it over and now he can use the same angle and method for the other side. I get it. It's upside down and it's not natural for your eye. Back up. Don't don't think so much downstream. Back up on the upstream side, side of this thought and realize that you're not looking at how the fly is relative to your eye, you're looking at your tying position 
and how it's relative to the hook eye and the hook shank. And as long as that hook eye and the hook shank is always in relative to your tying position, you're going to be consistent. Turn it over, get it in position, affix your eye. And Maldonado did it. Daniel did it. They've looked at their eyes from different angles to make sure that what they saw initially was confirmed at a different angle. I'll often, is this the one where it was my eyes? I tied it. Here it is. So this particular bucktail has a UV head, okay? And I will 100% credit this to Jay Zimmerman. I went in one day and he showed me how to, to build a UV head. But when you put your eyes on, I'll often do my first eye. I'll get it, again, relative to the hook eye and the shank. And when I turn it over, my head is telling me the fly's upside down. You need to tie upside down. I don't. I don't. I need to tie relative to the hook point and the hook shank because that's what I did on that side. So then once I get my eyes in and I use the same thing, use a gel glue that dries slowly. That way, if you have to go in and make adjustments, you have time to do that. He, Daniel's doing the same thing. He's making sure that what he knows that his eyes are spot on where they need to be, right? Now he can continue with that, with, with the glue and keep things solid where they need to be. It's, it's a very, very easy thing to do and a very easy mistake to make because we're human beings. Uh, all the cats and anglers all have heard me say this. One of the biggest advantages we have as humans is we have two thumbs and a brain. And one of the biggest disadvantages is we have two thumbs and a brain. So use it to your advantage that we have these opposing thumbs and a brain. Don't let it get in your way. Don't let it, don't overthink things. Your tying position, whether you know it or not, is always consistent. You're always in the same tying position. So find out what that position is and then get a relative view of what the hook eye and the hook shank look like from that position. So when you do turn your fly over, it looks like everybody else's. It, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's a great way to kind of turn the view of your fly or how you're looking at your tie upside down. And you'll get really, really, really nice UV heads and eyes that are nice and even. Maldonado, and they, they, they got it going on. They're thinking of the little things. He also used, Daniel also used the hook point as a reference. That's not going to change. That's the beautiful thing. It's in your vice. It's there. So you can always use that angle. It's always there. I use an angle off the hook eye and the hook point all the time because they're consistent. They're always there. I can count on them. So my angles are always consistent. So just great ties from Maldonado and Daniel there. They, they're using their heads and they're thinking man tires. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about a few other things, and then we're going to set up our final fly. And I have forgotten what that is. Uh, predator fly from a streamer fly. We can cover that. I am so sorry, guys. I've been talking about so many things. That's my bad. Rigging. That's what it was. Okay. So rigging for bait fish and and, and, and the, those swimming jerk flies that, that you see a lot. And when I say a jerk fly, you're literally, you're, you're strip, strip, strip. And because you've really tied it to where instead of being fusy form, and again, my hands aren't, but, but fusy form being more round, right? To a fly that's going to keel and really be a jerk bait. Um, you can, you can really rig however you want to rig to your fly. I mean, listen, anything that I tie, man, I mean, any streamer or car flies on a loop, not in the, and again, I think the, the basic foundation is in the, the physics of how one relates to the other. Um, if I tie any, any fly, if I tie a rainbow warrior, a headstand, uh, a, a hipster doofus or a, a jungle junkie, how I fix that to the tippet is going to affect how this fly reacts in the water. So here's the, the cut dry, easy way to think about it. And you can kind of evaluate how you want to do it at that point. But if you think about it like this, it'll kind of make it uh, a yes or no or pretty cut dry decision. If you want the tippet 
your tippet to dis like to dictate what your fly does, then use a clinch nut. If you want the fly to dictate what it does, use a loop nut. And the logic behind that is if you've got a clinch knot tied down to the hook eye, the tippet's going to tell that fly what to do. It's going to tell it when to sink. It's going to tell it when to move. Um, and then anything, trout fly nymph, streamer, anything, right? The dick, it, it, it's tied, so it's going to dictate the movement. Granted, the heavier the fly, physics will win. I'm not arguing with that. In general, connected to the hook eye will dictate what the fly does. If you reverse that mentality and go to a to a loop, now the tippet is going to allow the fly to dictate what the what the tippet does. And when you design a fly to do something specific, it's important to allow it to do that. So by tying the loop knot in your rig with a bait fish is going to allow it to do what you want it to do. So for instance, if it is a jerk bait and you've got your, your fly tied to where it's keeled and it's up and down and you're looking for that fly to dart, dart, and then go broadside and wander, and that's where the predator fish hit when that, when that fish goes broadside, then having that loop knot is going to dictate and help that fly dart, dart, and move. Having a, a, a clinch knot on that, you're not going to get as free of the movement as you would with the loop. You may get some of it, but at the end of the day, the, the, the tip is running the show. Again, my car analogy. Loop knot, the fly is driving the car and the tippet is riding shotgun. Clinch knot, the tippet's driving the car and the fly is riding shotgun. And I'm going to double snap for you, Charlie. And that's kind of an easy way to kind of look at that and go, all right, I want this to happen. I want that to happen, right? If you're just looking for flies to get down and, and, and go with what your tippet does, clinch it up. But if you're going to design a fly to do a specific thing in the water, whether that's push water and move around and vibrate or dart and go broadside, then a loop knot is going to really, really benefit all of that work that you did on the vice. And that's that's really all it does. It helps you see what you saw in your mind in the water. Super easy to not know that. You go out, you tie the clinch knot, and you're like, why is that not working? Your tippet is inhibiting the movement of that fly at that point. So, yeah, that's an easy way to go about it. One way or the other, one is driving the car and is going to dictate what your fly does. That's kind of a good way to think about rigging with uh, a bait fish or a predator fly. And I personally am, my gosh, let me think about this. I, I, I hate to say 100% of the time because that's just not fair because I'm sure there are times I use a clinch. But even when I'm neuro nymphing, and I'm tying on my dropper, right? I have a dropper and a point. I'm still leaving enough. Like I'll over, I'll keep rule of thumb, right? Six inches or so for your tag. I'll leave eight inches so I can tie a loop. <laughs> I'm that stubborn. I really like the loop. I really want that nymph to move around and tumble like a drifting nymph. So by putting it to a clinch knot, I may be inhibiting what that fly may naturally be doing. And, and, I, and I'm not talking about carps, ever, anything. So I'm a big loop knot fan. There are times where a clinch is going to help you just get the fly where you want to get it. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't do that. Absolutely. If anybody watches golf and is aware of Phil Mickelson's practice habits, he practices shots that he may never take. So when that random 1% shows up, the muscle memory that he's in, like, put in his body with that random shot is now familiar. So I do that a lot of times for that. So it happens. I'm going to do that. But at the for the most part, I like having that loop knot. So my muscle memory just, just rolls on through and that fly is moving. But listen, I don't always go that way. There comes a time where I'm like, you know what? The flow rates aren't working with me. The weight of my fly isn't working with me. And I really want to fish that fly. So I know that with, with the floral that I have tied on, I can increase my sink rate with the clinch knot. Side note, I use fluoro first for sink rate, second for durability, and then a distant third for transparency. I'm not going to open that can of worms. That's just me. That's just me. It's sink rate and durability for the most part. 
ancillary benefit, it's a little bit, a little bit more invisible. I'm good with that. Okay. This next fly, I am spinning up for my cart bag after these are done. I kid you not. The first fly that I'm tying for myself is going to be the Rio Grande. Let me tell you. The Rio Bandita. It's a cart fly. I know. I know. Chris tied it for cichlids. Warm water fish. And every species eats this. And I'll tell you why. He's done the same thing that very, very few fly anglers want to do. And that's tie that small, unimposing craw. And because it's small, it has the ability to look like a premature crawl. And those premature crawls don't have developed claws. I did research a couple years ago. I talked with, with uh, Rick Mikesell about this. Berkeley fly or Berkeley Fishing did a huge, huge report on crawfish and how bass and carp eat crawfish. And bass and, and the reason carp were in the study is because they tend to be in the same areas eating the same things. Both species, for the most part, would eat juvenile crawfish or injured crawfish without claws. Think about it. It seems pretty logical, right? Would you eat something that could pinch you after you ate it? No, you would eat the baby without developed pinchers or the injured one so you could eat and move on without getting chewed up on the inside until that thing digested. Again, I'm not a fish, <laughs> but I am thinking like one. The Rio Bandito, that's why, I mean, I'm telling you what, the, the aquatic authenticity on that fly has got to be through the roof. I've read the amount of fish that this, this fly has caught, and I cannot wait to hammer fish with that fly in Colorado. So kudos to you. Kudos to you, Chris, on getting a fly that you know is going to be eaten by tons of fish. So pay attention to, like, juvenile crawl videos because juvenile crawls are a very, very good way to approach fish. And by the way, Berkeley didn't make lures that were crawless or clawless for crawls because on the conventional side, they wouldn't sell. And it's, it, 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 it's simple. I used to fish on the conventional side, so I get it. I understand. I know where their mind is. It's big, it's gaudy, and there's claws everywhere. You don't ever see conventional tackle minimized very much it's usually pretty big and gaudy and the sh the shelf value or the bin appeal is not there for a clawless crawl on the conventional side it's quite different on the fly side because we get that the cycle of bugs is just that they have a life cycle they're not born with claws they're very more they're very edible and softer in the those those pre early baby or young stages. You get it. Clawless crawls are where it's at. And I bet for any, for any, that's why this fly is so good. So without any further ado, here it is, the Rio Bandito. And this fly is going to catch you a lot of warm water fish. All right, our next fly is going to be one that uh, I'm quite fond of, to be quite honest. And I know uh, it's kind of like parents saying they love their children. But for me, this fly is one of the best all-species flies that I have ever created. And this one's the Rio Bandito. It was invented out of a need for essentially a very, very easy-to-tie juvenile crayfish imitation specifically for our Rio Grande cichlids, which are a really awesome native that we have here in Central Texas. Um, it is the only native species of cichlid to the U.S., and we've got them all over the Texas Hill Country. Um, and that's why this fly was originally invented. Since then, I've caught, you know, everything from mountain cutthroat, you know, up in high mountain lakes, all the way to, you know, carp and all sorts of bass and sunfish and catfish, you name it, they've eaten it. And so that's the the really awesome thing about this fly. Uh, I mean, I've even caught tailwater browns on this thing, bouncing it around rocks and, uh, you know, right behind current seams and stuff like that, just right behind boulders. It works really, really well for that sort of stuff. But very, very easy fly to tie uh, with a little bit of uh, basic instruction. I think anybody could tie this. Uh, start off, this is a side 
Rise uh, 12 TMC 403 BLJ. Um, and you can do this on a myriad of jig hooks. This was a really, really good one for this fly. Uh, this is a tungsten slotted bead in kind of a metallic red. There's a number of brands out there. Um, all I'm going to do is use kind of a burnt orange thread. You want to make sure that bead is situated as far up as you can get it. Burnt orange thread here. Just simply start the thread, give it a trim, and we're just going to work our way down the hook. Little thread base here. And everything kind of starts at this point. So this entire fly uses essentially two materials. One is Australian possum, uh, and that is this right here. So this is just Australian possum in a crawfish orange. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there and just tell you this is a very, very hard material to find. Um, it used to be produced through Hairline Dubbin. They still obviously have what they call Aussie possum, uh, but they have ceased making it in this color. So watch your hook point there. Simply tie in this tail. You'll notice that I'm still kind of right. If this hook had a barb, it's still right there is where I'm tying this in. It's all I'm doing. And I'm going to go ahead and work this back up towards the bead a little bit. I'll stop just short. I'm going to come in here and trim this off about right there. If you'll notice, that leaves me a little bit of head space right there. But I can tie all that off and it's nice and clean. Just a little Australian possum tail. Very, very easy fly to tie. You're going to love this. All we're going to do is take a pair of nymph silly legs in the barred pumpkin, tie those, center them up on top, get them exactly where you want them, and I simply wrap these down towards the tail. Right before I get to the tail, I split them out each side. I'm going to try to turn this this way where you all can see it. That way, it simply, as I wrap backwards, it positions those legs on either side of the tail so that they're split out. Uh, not not on top of the tail, but actually on either side of it. So kind of on your final wrap, just kind of get right over the top, check it, make sure they're where you want them, and that should be good to go. A little tag piece there, you can just get rid of it. All right, the rest of this fly, literally all of it, uh, from the hook bend all the way to the bead, is nothing but a spun dubbing loop. Um, so kind of an interesting thing. All we're going to do is simply take a needle, split the thread. If you want to do this as an off, uh, you know, off hook loop, you can do this too. But I simply split the thread. This is just eight aught here, so it's a pretty easy thread to split. I'm using Vivas. Take the under fur from any of that Australian possum, or you can even find other dubbings that are roughly that, you know, kind of burnt orange, crawfish orange. Um, you can you can find all sorts of dubbing, but you know, it's just Australian possum under fur. Essentially, is all this is. I am taking little patches of this dubbing inserting it in the thread and then i took another bit of this stuff and this is australian possum that i've simply taken off the hide and i've inserted in one of those petty john uh, magic tool clips i'm going to simply take that insert it into that dubbing loop and let go if you'll notice i can simply make a couple initial spins with my fingers and then spin the bobbin, so it's just spinning. And then I'm going to move all those twists up into that dubbing brush. To where now I've got this really great, tight, compact dubbing brush. If there's any like real crazy wild stuff here, see how we've got a couple of big clumps in that brush. I don't know if that shows up real, real well on camera. I'm going to lose that. So basically what I have is under fur first, then the guard hair is on the other. All we're going to do here, make sure you don't catch your legs. You're going to start right there at the rear of the hook. One right in front of the other, all the way up to the bead. And you'll notice this right about the time we get to the bead, we start hitting guard hairs. And that's exactly what we want. Stroke all of this back every couple of wraps. Give that a stroke back. And we're going to just fill up that space right behind the bead, just stroking this back. Make sure that thread tucks in there nice and neat. Couple of wraps, give it a pull, whip finish. Throw a couple of those in there. You can throw a little bit of head cement on this if you want, if you so desire. All right. All we're going to do to finish this fly, this is kind of the funny part, is we are going to take our dubbing brush and we are going to throw this in the hook gap here. Once again, I'm going to roll the dubbing brush. So if you have even a gun cleaning brush or something like that would work right here, where you try to get it inside the hook gap to brush that out, fluff it out a little bit. And then on the underside, just kind of tease out as much as you can. Just kind of going back and forth. Tease that. Make it all fluffy-like. And then all we're going to do in our final step, trim the legs pretty short. They're about as long as the tail. 
you know, maybe even right the same length. I don't like them super long on this. The reason why is because our cichlids, they, they pick up a fly. They don't actually, uh, they don't do like normal fish do where they inhale a fly. They actually pick it up. And then here, I'm going to come in here and trim the back of the fly flush. So go right down the middle. And come in there and give it a nice tight haircut. And I want that pretty tight where you'll see the underside of that fly definitely has a little bit more of a flat top now. And that's what we're left with. We're left with this really great little buggy juvenile crayfish pattern. And this thing is lights out on just a wide variety of species. Absolutely love this fly for our cichlids, for our sunfish, for our bass, but I take this thing trout fishing a lot. So great all round pattern to have in your box. I think you'll enjoy it. Easy to tie, fun to fish, and just an absolute staple in my Texas Hill Country fly box. Chris Johnson, dude. Okay. You ever find like someone who's tying flies that really see things the way you see things and tie things in the way you tie things in? Like I could hang out and tie flies with Chris and we would get along instantly. Um, so his attention to what he's doing on the hook shank and within the fly is, is, is I love it. I love it. I'm a big fan. When you look at someone who's thinking about a dubbing loop on two levels, what he's, what he's really doing is he's kind of deconstructing a composite loop, right? A composite loop is taking materials and stacking them on each other. So you can achieve a specific density flash or movement within a, a dubbing loop with multiple materials. And I love it. It's a big, it's, it's, it's a great way to build a dubbing loop and, and, and control your dubbing loop. That said, he's deconstructing. So instead of layering different things on one dubbing loop, He's stacking them in concession. So he's got all his under fur, which is going to breathe, react, and vibrate differently than the guard hair. I'm an audio guy. I've mentioned that. So he is like, I've watched this video a few times. I'm, I told, when I said I'm tying those flies, I'm tying a bunch of those flies. Love it. There's a lot happening with that fly with how I tie my flies and that he's thinking about the complete forage level on the baby side when we know those juvenile craws are so vulnerable to be eaten too he's tying and trimming his fly to do what he wants it to do subsurface and then three he's using materials in a very creative way to have different vibrations from the start of that fly to the end of that fly and i know that sounds minute like those vibrations don't mean a big thing you have to realize and think about fish have lateral lines for a reason, Like they're using those for a reason. So if, we're, if, if every angler is hammering home silhouette or proportion or color, someone along the line is going to overlook that. And at that point, we know we can win or maybe bring something else to the table that nobody else is. So, Think about all of those details and how you're presenting your fly, how those materials stack, how those vibrations affect your fly. All we see are the same material, Australian opossum, which by the way, HVR tar, HVRT car fly, that's the tail. I'm with you, Chris. I get you, brother. That, that opossum, and I say opossum because it's from Australia, and I went down that rabbit hole. Australia opossum, America opossum. They're interchangeable, but species-wise, that's how it lies out. Australian possum has a little more kink to that tail. The hair is wavier or kinkier, and that provides a little more buoyancy and separation in that tail. So when that tail with the Australian possum is subsurface, it's breathing more than regular possum, but not collapsing like rabbit. Love that material, and that's precisely why I use that on my HVRT car fly, is because it doesn't collapse. Now, he's using that on the bottom of his dubbing loop. What's in the top? All the under fur. That's all the stuff that gives you a softer vibration. It's going to absorb water and let water pass through and move, whereas the guard hairs are going to slow water down and vibrate. 
you've got two different vibrations all next to each other. It's a phenomenal way in a very easy way to create this sub vibration that the lateral line in any species that you're fishing is going to pick up. Sometimes it's just that one thing, that one thing in a bad condition or an off, off water situation that gets your fly eaten. So that is just, yeah, one of my favorites of the night for sure as a carp guy. Um, yeah. So let's pay some bills here, right? TU, are you signed up? Charlie, double snap for you, brother. Uh, TU has been sponsoring these, man. Shout out to those guys. I mean, we're in our third year. This year's been going strong. Warm water this week. I'm going to tease next week in a minute. I'm not going to tease my tease. Not going to do that. Okay. Um, this is YouTube. You get to see the whole picture. If you're on Instagram, you can see me now. But guess what? Only YouTube can see me now. So if you're on Instagram, I know, I know you love Insta, but I'm telling you, the full picture is on YouTube. Head over to YouTube, like, subscribe, and there's this little bell. You hit that bell. And every time Uncle uploads a video and you go into YouTube, you're going to have a notification. Click on notification, boom. Anything Uncle has done is right there. You can see everything that we've uploaded. It's a pretty nice feature. So get all of that done to keep you in the know. When this video is done, do not leave now. I promise there's more. Go to Umpa's YouTube page. All of these videos will be there. You can watch them in their entirety. Stop, pause, back up. Watch my very, very, very prepared statement about this show. And then tie some flies. And that's really what we're all about is, is learning how to tie some flies. Learn something from one facet or one technique and move it over. Every winter, and listen, I don't want to keep everybody up all night. Every winter, I try and do something different to try and bring back when I come back into the carp side. You know, one winter it was hoppers. One winter it was streamers. One winter it was tinkara flies. By going down rabbit holes, you learn some really interesting techniques that you can bring back, transfer to carp. They don't always transfer. You're going to find out, you know what? This transfers, this doesn't transfer. But tying different flies with different techniques will get you to be a better, efficient tire. So that's what I have to say about that. I'm not going to keep you up all night. There's a few more things that I, I'm not really comfortable saying, but it's going to be a humble brag slash promotion. Uh, I run a business. I have a small little fly shop. I don't have a ton of flies on there. And there's a good reason for that. I only sell what I fish. So if you're in the market for some carp flies, head over to Nervous Water Flies. I'll be happy to take care of you. If you want to head over to your local fly shop, I have flies that Umpqua is going to be carrying this year. And your fly bins could be holding my flies. This year, the Hipster Doofus in the Detroit Mop City will be occupying bins around the globe. I cannot believe I'm saying that. Um, thank you, Rick Mikesell. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you, Jeremy. What that means is that you can walk into a fly shop and say, hey, I'm looking for some car flies. And I think the first few flies that you should grab, and, and I'm not kidding, the first few flies that you should grab for your box are backstabbers, various car flies, Lance Egan's headstands. And if you have anything local, put that in your box. Now, I want you to round out your box with some of my patterns. My patterns aren't the end-all be-all, and they're not going to catch every fish in the book, but they're great, solid, reliable, durable patterns that will round out your collection. And I can only tell you this because I've had multiple people catch fish in so many different manners and tell me that. So it's not just my opinion. Uh, I want to give Texas and Arizona. I love you guys. You guys have been super, super great to me. The rest of the U.S., come on, let's go. Don't let Texas and Arizona have the top notch. Show them what's up. These flies will fish every pond and, 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 and every river. You just have to kind of look at the fish you're fishing and apply that fly to that situation. And I really am a believer of that. I talked earlier about conditions. Don't let conditions or fish dictate when you should fish. Just go and fish. You're going to learn something. You're going to see something. You're going to catalog something. And you're going to learn next time out, that's what I should do or that's what I shouldn't do. Just how it works. This is how it is. So my flies, 
I want you to build out with all the tried and true carp flies out there. Round out your, your collection with some of my patterns. I really do feel that soft landing and slow sinking flies that are my jam are going to help balance your box. We're always going to have a lot of flies that can sink. I have my Detroit Mop City is a get down like James Brown and bump it along and hammer carp fly. I'm, it's, I'm not anti or pro. I tend to lean toward those soft landing flies. So round out your collection with something that lands soft, whether it's an Egan's headstand, whether it's a, a, a Zimmerman's backstabber. And let me tell you, man, that fly has caught a lot of fish for me. There are so many tried and true flies out there. Don't overlook just because they're of, like a generational. Those flies are there for a reason. So trust me, you know, if you can find trouser worms, tie a trouser worm, buy a trouser worm, man, I will tell you right now that I won't step onto a river unless my box has trouser worms. It is really a tried and true river fly. So there's a lot of flies out there and my flies aren't the end all be all. And I'm not ever going to tell you they are because there's so many other more like talented tires that are going to put really solid flies out there. But I do feel that mine are going to contribute and balance out your box. Whether you want something that gets down like James Brown or land softly and uh, will sink slowly. And again, when you have a slowly sinking fly from me, try and use that floating line to get that arc. If you hold up, you're really going to control that drop and make it more vertical. Slow sinking, think arc. So use your floating line to really help that presentation and give a more lifelike and natural fall. It's, 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 it's going to help out, I promise. Um, what else? So, so next week on the 17th, there's something pretty neat happening. I'm going to be holding a class for fly tying at Trout's Fly Fishing. I know, I'm so, I have an Angler's All hat, and I work at Angler's All. I know. Thank you, Trout's. This is the deal. They've been super kind to me. They've carried my flies just as, as Angler's All has. So I, I'm all about supporting all local fly shops, and I think all of our fly shops are part of our community, and I think you should go to all of them. I have three fly shops within 30 minutes of me. And for me, that's, that's pretty awesome. I can go to Angler's All, Trout's, or Charlie's within 30 minutes. And that's with traffic, by the way. So find a local fly shop, support them. If you want information, go in, grab a handful of flies, throw them down, and chat someone up. It's a scratch your back kind of situation, right? It's, it's really easy. They're more than welcome to help you out. And our communities are changing. Fly fishing communities aren't what we thought they were. We're in a new era. Fly fishing is a new game. And we're more about supporting and putting more people on the river that we want to put on that are stewards of what we believe in. So support those local fly shops. They're going to support you. And we all win at that situation, in, in, in that situation. So I just, I, I, I can't say enough about that. So Trout's is going to be holding a class next week on the 17th. It's a fly tying class. And I'm going to be doing it. So if anything that I said tonight interests you and you want to have more of a one-on-one -on -one kind of conversation about those topics, head over to troutsflyfishing.com. Not now. Please. After the video. Actually, after you kind of go to Umpqua's YouTube page and see what they've uploaded, then go to Trout's, right? Go to their page for lessons and page art. I think it's actually uh, education. And you'll see the five time classes there. It's going to be a limited class. And from what I've told, I've talked to Yvonne, and Yvonne tells me that we're set up for streaming. So, I've got even better news. If you're not local and you want to take that class, we will have streaming capabilities. So if you're out of state and you're like, that wackadoodle Daryl Akins has some pretty good ideas that I want to learn, you can do it locally. Or I'm sorry, out of state via stream, not just locally. So listen, man, I, all I'm doing is preaching what I've learned on top of what Charlie has taught me and what Jay has taught me. If I can expound upon those blocks, I'm good. I'm getting hoarse. I talk a lot. I work at a fly shop now, so I talk all day. So I apologize. I'm going to power on. So 
I think it's important to, to, to know that although I started only a handful of years ago, my intent was never to be here talking to you, as crazy as that is. And let me share this. I started this way, and I would imagine almost everybody does. Fly tying starts out as a selfish venture. Not in a bad way. We want a color, a size, or a version of a fly that we can't find in a bin. So we tie it. That's selfish. That's not a bad thing, right? However, the golden moment in this is that over the time of tying flies selfishly, unbeknownst to you, it becomes a selfless task. This whole hobby and obsession that you have becomes selfless. Now you're tying all these flies and giving them away to your friends. Fish these, fish these, try this. Fly tying is unique that way. I really, really believe that it's unique in that way in that we get into it selfishly because we want flies that we can fish because we can't find them. Before we know it, we're tying flies for our friends and our buddies or giving them, try this, fish this. So understand that what we do, it's okay to start selfishly, but we all end up selflessly tying flies for everybody else, sharing the information, sharing the, the material list. Charlie, anglers all, trout, putting up tying videos, letting you know, hey, that bug that you really, really like, here's how you tie it. Here's exactly what you need to do. So support a local fly shop. Hey, come out and get a class with me next week, the 17th. I'm going to be doing a class of trout. So if you want to kind of like sit in and have some one-on-one -on -one with me, next week is the time to do it. I'll be posting on my story on Instagram, Nervous Water Flies. My voice is going, but I'm still powered through. And you can find me there. Anybody out, DM me. I am entirely reachable. I think it's very important for any of us commercial tires that fulfill orders for somebody's hard-earned money that we're approachable and reachable. I have cats in Arizona that text me, hey, I just put an order in. Can you make it all black? Yeah, no problem. We'll try that somewhere else. You know, reach out to me. I got you. So whether it's a custom order, whether it's going through an ordering what I'm tying up, whether it's a class next week, you're going to get the same passion the same meticulous kind of point of view. I'm a nerd that way and, and, and self-proclaimed rightfully. I, I, I own that. If you've seen the Trout's video for the Detroit Mop City, it's over an hour. After tonight, you get it. So my passion often dictates how often or how long I'm going to talk. I love it. I love fly time. Uh, Umpqua, Jacob, phenomenal on, on, on shooting and editing. Put a blurb up on, on the story about how I tied flies. When I left a lesson with Charlie, I tied that night because I felt if I tied the next day, something was going to slip. I wasn't going to be as fresh. So I left and I tied for hours. I would tie dozens that night. Wake up the next morning, check them out, tie more. So it's all up to the individual. There's no standard or you have to do that. Just do it. I think that's really what, what, what makes you good within your own standards. My standards are mine. You know, there's a, a quote out there within the football realms that may have been Lombardi, I think. We strive for excellence or we strive for perfection, right? And no human being is going to get to perfection. However, below perfection is excellence. I'm going to argue with anybody that wouldn't be happy with falling into excellence. So, do I, strive, do I strive for perfection? Well, yeah, I do. That's just kind of who I am, you know? But I don't want the fly perfect. I really, really don't, you know, because I like those imperfections or the tire's thumbprint to give something to that fly that's distinctly different. So, listen, that's a little bit of how I approach flies. That's a little bit how I approach to design a fly. And if you sign up for a class to me next week with trouts, you're going to hear a lot about that and probably more in in-depth. I'm going to cover lift kits. I'm going to cover dubbing loops. I'm going to cover making sure you build your dubbing loop from the beginning all the way to where it's done wrapped on the chain that you've 
manage that at every stage to make sure you're aware of where every part of that material was wrapped around the shank for a balanced fly. I help you out. I promise. All that's going to be transferable to different flies. All right. So I'm going to have to cut it short because if I keep going on, then why would you sign up for the lesson next week, right? You're just going to listen to this. So I have to kind of hold something back. Uh, so I will encourage you, please, head over to troutsflyfishing.com. Check it out on their education page. That's where their lessons are. They'll be listed. If you're not local, they have a streaming option. Sign up. We'll take care of you. And I will just pound you with information on fly tying. And we're going to spin some bugs as well. All right. Um, Trout Unlimited. Thank you. Not just from everybody. From me. Like, thank you. I'm a competitor in Carp Slam. Like, thank you for what you do for the DSP. Carp Slam. Go to their site. Look at the Carp Slam. And if you're carp guys out there local, sign up and compete. It's a great way to test your ability to do one thing at a specific time, at a specific place, with specific conditions. It's a very, very esoteric situation, and it will challenge you as an angler. I love it. I love it. D, like, yeah, I love it. So try to limit it. Thank you very much. Uh, I've told you to like, subscribe, and hit that bell up top. If you haven't done that yet, do it. That's always a good thing. It's a fly time class next week. I have a business, Nervous Waterflies, now, next week. Lake and high alpine stuff. And we have got, I'm not going to go out and, and say the L word. I'm just going to say that we've got a cat that knows what he's talking about, a reputation for what he's talking about. And quite honestly, I don't know if we were to compare the fishiness, like the overall level of fishiness between Landon Mayer Meyer, and, 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 and uh, Lance Egan, do you think we can compare those? I mean, seriously, if you were to think about, and, and just as adds up, I've worked with, with Lance unknowingly because I do post-production for fly fishing films. So all the modern nymphing stuff that I've done all, I've seen all the stuff that never made the film with Lance. Lance accidentally catches fish. I'm not, yeah, love your brother. And I know you're never going to say it, but some people are born with this fish gene. I think both of those cats, Landon and Lance, they were born with the fish gene. They just, they got it. So if someone's going to talk to you about fishing a, a specific technique, like Landon or Lance, I'm tuning in. So next week, Landon's going to be talking to you about Lake Alpine uh, or High Alpine fishing. And that's pretty good stuff. Uh, this year, one of my goals, a three or four weight in hoppers, small creeks, high elevation. So I'm going to be tuning in and I'm going to be tying flies from this whole series that I can use uh, for my summer goals without a doubt. Uh, but yes, next week is going to be top notch. I can't uh, say enough about that. So that's pretty much everything. I believe I, I, I could keep going. Like I said before, it's like a driver's ed car. I've got a gas pedal. I've got a steering wheel and I can pretty much do anything I want to do. But if I look to my right, Sam's over there and he has a brake pedal. So if I, if I get out of control, he can kind of like put the brakes on and go, we're done. We're going to wrap. We're going to send everyone off and let them go. So I'm going to wrap up. And that in itself is going to be long. But just to kind of wrap up the whole night, warm water fly time. Listen, I, it's, it's, it's kind of what I fell into unknowingly. Whether it's streamers, car flies, bass fly, like predator or shrimp. All of this stuff really is connected. There are cousins and they're all, that's why they're all bunched here. So if your questions aren't answered within my unbashingly level of just babbling, you want to rewatch these videos? You want to reach out to me at Nervous Waterflies and DM me? I'm all about it. Please ask me. I'm more than happy to answer. I really am. If you want to stop in at Angler's All and chat me up, do that. If I don't have the answers. We've got an unbelievably talented staff at Anglers All that will have any question you have answered. I promise. So, yes, all that. You know, Anglers All, Trouts, Charlie, stop into any of those places, support them, come see me, sign up for a fly class, support 
uh, Denver Trout Unlimited and make sure that you check out uh, Carp Slam. Carp Slam is the best. I'm telling you, I'm I'm really kind of pumped up now because I I, I like warm water. So so listen, go to Umpqua's YouTube page. All of these videos are there. Uh, even Charlie's. Now listen, I've read the chat. Charlie's not going to be nearly as animated as me. I'm working on that. He's pro double espresso. I'm pro triple espresso. So I'll compromise. I'll try the double. We'll work on Charlie being more animated with the double snap. But at the end of the day, we all love what we do. We all love time flies. And we all nerd out on making sure that the fly that we tie is going to deliver. And not just for us. Like, Umpqua just Umpqua puts our flies out around the globe. So that standard is going to speak volumes for us, right? Right. I mean, we are going to believe in ourselves to a certain level when someone else believes and stands up for that. I think that speaks for everybody when a third party says we're good. Not only are we good, but we're going to put it all over the globe. So you can walk in any fly shop or go to any internet web browser and find that individual's fly. So just know the standard from Umpqua is the highest. And, and that's why it Umpqua is what it is because of the standards. And I am more than humbled and beyond privileged to know that my flies are being distributed by Umpqua. I can't speak enough about that. So when you enter something for the right reasons, I think that you end up in a situation, i.e. this one, for the right reasons. So, Umpqua, thank you very much. I can't thank you enough. Trout Unlimited, Trouts, Anglers All, Charlie, every local fly shop here in Colorado. I love you. And most importantly, Rick Mikesell, just because I wouldn't be here had he not got the ball rolling. Thank you, Rick. I really appreciate you, brother. Uh, so, listen, next week, um, same bat time. No. Same Umpqua time, same Umpqua channel, right? That works. Tune in. 7 p.m. and listen to Landon. I doubt he's going to be as animated, long-winded in this as me, but I can tell you this much: the information is going to be spot on and reliable. So tune in next week. Check out what Landon has to say. I'm going to be there. I get off at six o'clock. I'll be home in the chat typing it up. So tune in next week. We're going to see you then. Make sure you've liked, subscribed, the notification bell up above my shoulder. Go check out Trout Unlimited's website. Go check out every local fly shop in your area. Buy a group of flies. Support them. And, of course, go fish, walk, hike, and smile. Thank you for hanging out with me.